Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Wisconsin Lawyers Mutual Insurance Company's 18th annual late fall or year end in this case uh, webinar today. Um, we're happy you've joined us. We certainly wish you could be in person with us, uh, but because of the pandemic, of course, we're uh, on live doing virtual programs and we certainly appreciate you joining us. Uh, today, we will have a couple different panel discussions. We're going to have the first one from nine o'clock until about 10.15. Uh, and the second one will be from 1030 to close to noon. So we'll have a 15 minute break in between so you can plan your morning accordingly. I am happy to report that this program uh, has been approved for three ethics credits. So you, uh, you will get your ethics credits uh, if you attend this entire program, uh, three of them anyway. Uh, so that's, that's good news. Um, you have a couple of different tabs on your screen one tab is a, is a tab called Ask the Speakers. Uh, if you have a question or a comment, uh, you wanna weigh in on the conversation, uh, hit that tab and type in your question or comment and you click either submit or send, I can't recall which, but uh, it'll be self-explanatory, you'll see it. And send that over and we will get your question or comment and we will uh, incorporate that into the conversation. So uh, keep that in mind, I encourage you to jump in whenever you want to, uh, our speakers are happy to address questions uh, and comments throughout the day. And uh, also you don't have to wait until the end. Uh, you know, there's not necessarily a, a formal uh, panel ending Q and A session. Uh, we will certainly entertain questions at the end, but uh, more importantly, we'll take questions throughout. So feel free to jump in. Um, you will get uh, an email after today's program asking for some evaluations on our topics and program. I would encourage you and ask you to fill that out and send it back over to us. We do use your comments and thoughts uh, to help us with future programs. We want to make these as, 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 as good as we can, and, and uh, we want to do topics that are instructive uh, and pertinent for all of you. So um, we, we certainly value your comments, so you will see that uh, after the program. Uh, with that said, uh, let's get started on our first panel. Um, today, we're, we're going to cover really a variety of, of topics, but, but a, a theme is uh, client expectations, client demands, um, uh, particularly during the pandemic. Um, certainly, I think client expectations and demands have been changing over the past several years, what with technology and uh, additional online resources for clients before they come and visit a lawyer. Uh, but with the pandemic, I think uh, that has been ramped up a little bit. And we have some uh, excellent uh, speakers with us today who can talk about their experiences and give us some ideas on how best to manage and handle those. Um, our first panel will talk about all of those things, uh, as well as other general practice issues that have been impacted by COVID uh, and not. Uh, and then our second panel uh, later this morning um, we'll deal with um, how those managed expectations, uh, if not handled properly, can lead to an OLR complaint or uh, maybe even a malpractice claim, and, and how do you manage that situation. So that's what we're looking at this morning. Um, again, thanks for being with us today. Uh, our first panel, uh, I have two terrific speakers with us. First, Kathleen Detman. She is a shareholder with Palmersheim Detman in Middleton. Kathleen concentrates her practice on business litigation, uh, including franchise disputes, copyright and trademark issues, uh, business breakups, non-compete and trade secret litigation, as well as general uh, contract disputes. Kathleen's work as a business attorney also includes providing estate and succession planning for both businesses uh, and individuals. Um, she enjoys working with family farms to resolve complex planning issues presented by farming businesses, um, as well as others. Prior to joining Palmersheim Detman, Kathleen worked for several years as a lobbyist and public policy analyst, representing a variety of clients' interests before the Wisconsin State Legislature. Uh, Kathleen graduated from the UW Law School cum laude. She also obtained her undergraduate degree from UW-Madison. Uh, also with us on the first panel is Mark Young. He practices in Wauwatosa. Mark has been in private practice since 1979 with a transactional practice concentrated heavily in real estate law, uh, business matters, estate planning and probate. Uh, Mark has written numerous articles for Wisconsin Lawyer Magazine, the State Bar publication, as well as publications for the ABA. 
Uh, Mark also is a frequent seminar presenter. I have presented with him in the past, and he has participated in the Lawyering Skills Program at the UW Law School and has also taught business law classes at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. So uh, Kathleen and Mark, thank you for being here today with us. We very much appreciate it. Um, let me start with you, Kathleen. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I mentioned uh, client expectations. Uh, maybe you can give us kind of a snapshot of, of some of the things you have seen during the pandemic and, and maybe even before as um, it, it appears like, you know, the client demands just keep getting uh, uh, tougher on, on lawyers and, and uh, uh, the challenges that, that those present. Sure. Yeah. I definitely enjoy talking about how unfair things are getting for us lawyers out there. Um, <laughs> The demands are certainly changing and, and it's happening even more rapidly now with the pandemic. I think clients are facing a host of legal and practical problems that are novel and the landscape is changing very rapidly. So when you couple that with the fact that clients are coming armed with more information than ever from the internet, it makes um, onboarding the client and working with the client through their particular problems uh, different and complex, I would say, um, especially when you consider sort of the increased uncertainty we are seeing with all of the new rules, regulations, and substantial new laws in, on uh, different fields, including employment, immigration, um, all of those fields are changing all the time. And we don't have the same kind of deep and broad administrative guidance on these new rules that we have had um, on our more longstanding rules like the general FMLA and things like that. So, um, you know, most clients that are running into problems are something like 75% of them are going to research them on their own before they come to a lawyer. And we have to break through some of the misconceptions that they may have, um, as well as talk them through the practical implications of the blog article that they read on the internet or something they heard on the news, particularly with the um, just glut of changes and new uh, frontiers that we're facing with the pandemic and all of the things that are being done to try to manage it. That also is a, a last piece I would say brings in a new layer of concerns on the application of the ethical rules to these situations where we still have to practice competently, we still have to act with diligence, and how do we do that in this new environment? Right, thanks Kathleen. Um, yeah, that sparks a, a number of different issues we can talk about. Uh, Mark, good morning and uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, your thoughts on, on what's out there these days? Well, I'm interested in seeing the, the changes, the expectations which are coming now and how much those may play out in the future as well. Some of them are temporary because of the pandemic, but they, there may be a permanence to some of them. I find that uh, more and more clients are, are on, uh, online now with the communication. I've got a few who do Zoom meetings, uh, but there's a balance there between those who uh, are technologically connected a great deal and those who aren't. So you need to have a foot in both of those worlds. Uh, but there are some, I use uh, DocuSign quite a bit for, for signing documents for contracts. And that was something which I was using before the pandemic, uh, but it's just been increased greatly since uh, the pandemic. And I, that will not diminish. That will just, because people become familiar with it now. There are changes that have come about. People are very familiar now with Zoom meetings if they're connected. So that will continue as well. Um, so yeah, I see that there are the, the changes which have come about. Uh, as far as the expectations from the clients, I think as Kathleen said, they're, they just keep increasing all the time. And uh, I think the speed with which they think we can get back to them uh, is just, enhanced by the technology. Uh, it used to be they could leave a telephone message for us or send us an email. And because they could send that email in a matter of a few seconds, they expected us to be able to get back to them just as quickly. And uh, th that's an expectation which I think we will always have to manage, except there are just more ways for them to connect with us. You know, I, uh, I Mark, I had a, a, a 
lawyer in, in one of my audiences uh, last year uh, raised his hand and say that he he uh, had a client who was e had a habit of emailing him around midnight, probably right before they go to bed, you know, and and he would get into the office and by nine o'clock, that client was calling him saying, hey, I, I sent you an email, but I haven't gotten I haven't heard back from you yet. Yep. And, uh, you know, so uh, he said, well, you know, what, what should I do about it? And several people in the audience jumped in and said, you know, you you have to set the ground rules early. Um, I don't know, Kathleen, do you find that to be true? Uh, you, you have to, and, and Mark, you can weigh in on this too, um, setting ground rules at the outset, um, not only with that kind of thing, but just generally, um, you know, how, how your representation is going to work, how, how responsive you can be and all of those things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the trick to dealing with any relationship is to, to set expectations at the beginning and, and so that people know what they can expect from you and what you can expect from them, of course. Um, so when it comes to the rapid communication expectations, you know, that's so troubling for all of us, especially when it's easy for a client, as Mark was saying, to just ask a question. The question can be simple and the answers are complicated. So it can take time to work through them. And of course, they're not the only client that's asking us those kinds of questions. So I think the speed of Google that we're all expected to operate under right now um, does create um, a good basis for having a conversation with a client about when you're actually going to be checking email. I am, I sort of jealously guard my private life when it comes to checking email and those kinds of things, unless there's something dramatic happening. I try really hard to put boundaries around that. And my clients understand that I am not, um, they generally don't have my cell phone number. I am not going to be checking emails at midnight. And if I think that it will be a period of time before I can get back to them on something, I almost always shoot them an email that says, hey, I received your email. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Because sometimes they just want to know that you've received it, it's present in your life, and that you're going to get to it. Because a lot of times, frankly, it's not actually an emergency. They want to know the answer to their questions or they want something addressed, but it's not that timely. They just, it's their one thing they're thinking about. So I think even just a short communication to sort of stave them off for a while can be helpful. Yeah, no question about it. Go ahead, Mark. I, I would agree. Yeah, just something, a communication. I saw your email. I can't deal with it now. Uh, and that also helps to inform them that uh, they're not the only client. They're not, it's not the only item on your desk that day. So that they, but I will be back, but it's going to be later this afternoon or won't be until tomorrow. I had a, a colleague who's now retired who used to tell his the clients who would send him an email and he'd say, well, I haven't seen them yet. My assistant brings me my emails at the end of the day. <laughs> I, I don't know if we can always get away with that. It was That was more the early days of clients getting used to emails. But I think there is uh, a time for that. I have also... I. Kathleen, I have the same approach that you have. I don't want the office intruding on my, my personal time, my family time uh, in the evenings and on the weekends. Having said that, uh, I, I do not give my cell phone number to clients. They, they do not have that number. Uh, for emails, I say they, I get those on my phone. I can see them. So I, I tell them if there's something that you need to, to reach out to me for over the weekend or an evening, shoot me an email. And I, I may not be able to get back to you on it, but send me the email. And I find many times just getting those, and even if they do come in at midnight, then I'll see them first thing in the morning um, and can respond to them then. So that, uh, which helps, you know, that it just shows the client that you're making the connection that, and it all comes down to that importance of communication uh, from an ethics standpoint that we need to stay connected to the clients and that communication. Um, I just find it, it's helpful just to reach out, as you said, Kathleen, a little bit, but also set the limits. Um, I wanted to get into, you know, different court orders and how the court operations have changed during the pandemic and, and that sort of thing. And, and as long as we're uh, going to move into that topic. We do have a couple of questions from the audience. We might as well get right into it here. Um, 
this is a lengthy question, so bear with me. Uh, here's the question from a viewer. The pandemic has created new laws and regulations in many areas, including on procedural issues in administrative law and in courts, uh, which can alter efficacy. Any thoughts as to how a practitioner might manage or keep up with changes and new laws and regulations, some of which, as you say, may survive post-pandemic and some of which may not survive uh, current challenge. And then a follow-up to that is uh, examples, new agency rulemaking in many fields and changes in local court rules. Um, and I did want to get into the local court rules and how those have kind of evolved during the pandemic. Uh, either of you want to uh, tackle this particular question? Sure. Yeah. I mean, Honestly, it's really difficult to keep up with it. I try hard to, um, you know, we get the emails every time something changes and I try to go immediately and look at what the new rules might be. <clears throat> Obviously for litigation, I'll practice in many different counties, but really I'm just keeping up regularly with Dane and Sock and some of the, the ones that I'm in the most often because you really can't, I mean, you, you can't keep up with it completely just in advance. So um, I have been finding that we're doing a lot more um, advanced communications with judges clerks because when we don't know the answers or how to proceed with something, it's always better to just reach out and ask, especially now because they, you know, the, um, the judges and, and everyone else are, are, they're sort of all in the same boat trying to figure out how we're going to get this, get through this, how we're going to take evidence, how we're going to make these hearings go forward in the way that they need to in this day and age. And so I have found at times, especially when it comes to evidentiary hearings and, and everything else, so if, if a judge hasn't actually addressed it before, we can call, ask a question and just put it out there in advance to open up a dialogue about how might we give this to you? We have this kind of information. How do you want to receive it? Um, and we're getting different responses on that depending on the judge. But from my perspective, um, keeping up as best I can, I have my assistant create, she created a template for me for different counties that we're in the most often. And how um, certain virtual appearance rules are being set so that that can be monitored to some extent. It's not perfect, but then really it's just not being afraid to pick up the phone and ask these questions. Um, you know, when you've been practicing for a while and you kind of know the lay of the land, that's one thing, but nobody really knows the lay of this land anymore. Um, especially if you know, I'm not a family lawyer or a criminal defense attorney, so I'm not in court every day. It's not like I know this stuff like the back of my hand now when it comes to the virtual appearances. So we're still trying to figure it out, um, you know, day by day as we go by. And I think I would just say one more thing. I think that these a lot of these virtual appearances for non-evidentiary hearings are going to continue to be electronic even after the pandemic. I, I know Inns of Court has been submitting some surveys on that for the Fairchild chapter about um, people tend to like the Zoom hearings when it doesn't involve taking evidence. Um, so I think we're just gonna be seeing more and more of that now that people are comfortable with it. So I think some of those changes are really here to stay. I like your ideas, Kathleen, uh, you know, organizing it either on a chart or, or something uh, to, to keep track because uh, missed deadlines are something we see in malpractice claims so often. and. Um, that was before the pandemic. You know, I, this whole thing, uh, I think, can create all kinds of mistakes. Uh, Mark? Uh, same thing with the uh, virtual hearings. And we've all gotten used to them. Um, I've come to enjoy them because I don't have to get in the car and drive to the <laughs> courthouse. So that's nice. But I also miss the, seeing the other lawyers at, at the courthouse which when I would go, and I'm in the probate courts primarily. So go at the courthouse, talk to the other lawyers. We'd exchange ideas of, of what we're doing, what's in practice, something that we've seen lately that, that's changing. Um, so I don't have that as much when it's all virtual, but I do enjoy being able to keep on working at the desk and not having that drive, especially if it's for something very perfunctory. I'm just going to make a quick appearance. Um, that's good to have that. Uh, I also, in following up on what Kathleen had said, in calling the, the courts and 
and ask the asking the question. I have found that I know with the registers in probate, they would rather have us call so that we do it right when it comes in. And they may have their own idiosyncrasies in the county, but I found they're very helpful and, and will offer a great deal of information. So that, that's just something that I think is, is vital. Um, I would like to think that after 40 years, I would have seen it all, but I'm reminded every day I haven't seen it all. So um, I would point out to the, the young lawyers who are just starting out, call the courts, call and ask the question. Um, I'll call another lawyer uh, and ask, how, how do you handle this sort of, of situation? Um, because it's, even though I have done this, I do a great deal of real estate law as well, uh, work. And, and I find, I would think that I would have seen it, the things in the transactions, but you don't see it. It's the luck of the draw, what comes through your door. So to be able to ask other lawyers and have them ask me if I've run into something, and, and often there is something uh, that helps a great deal but because someone's experienced it before and they can pass on that information to me or I can pass it on to them. Yeah, the pandemic certainly has created things none of us have ever seen before. Um, let me ask you both, um, the fact that we're not in the courthouses, um, does that uh, you know, you, you miss, I remember, you know, when I did, when I practiced family law, you know, you get into a hearing and you can kind of, you know, you can read body language, you can sense when there might be an opportunity to uh, forge a, an agreement, maybe before you step into the courtroom. Um, actually, uh, just got a comment from a viewer that said the little things that happen in the hallway and back of the courtroom no longer can happen. Um, do you, do you find that's a, a missing ingredient that, that is a, troublesome impediment sometimes to, to moving a case forward? I, I think it is when, and even in meeting with the clients versus talking with them over the phone, uh, I can get the basic information over the phone, but what I don't see is their facial reaction and responses. And there's so many times over the years when I have, uh, they have asked me a question or I have said something and I'll see their eyebrow go up. And there, there's something I would not have seen that over the phone. And I said, you had a response there. What, what, uh, did, what was your concern? And it, that elicits the question. It draws it out. And we miss that when we're not in person with people. Yeah, I right. totally agree with that. I think um, for schedulings and things, which are now over the phone anyway, when it comes to court hearings, that's it's fine to keep those via Zoom. But I think it would be a shame to move all non-evidentiary argument and other motion hearings, probate hearings, anything else to electronic means, because not only is it a good time to um, have informal discussions with counsel, with the client, to meet the meet the judge's clerk. I mean, those are good relationships to have. Um, you know, those are we miss all of those opportunities. But it's also a time along the lines of Mark was saying to I, heaven forbid, make friends with opposing counsel or the other lawyers that you're working with, because, you know, just by being able to share a conversation that's not conflict driven, um, those are good. Really, I mean, I I have a number of lawyers that I've worked with on the other side of cases that I do call when I have questions about things just to see what they think. Have you dealt with this before? Those things are invaluable, and it's really hard to do that when you're just staring at each other over a weird screen and. You can't see that personal um, the body language, the personal interactions. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's inevitable, but I think it will um, further reduce our ability to make connections professionally among the profession, which I think are really vital to keeping it livable. <laughs> yeah, so. I would I would agree with that because you need to have that uh, it, being able to relate to the other lawyers. I often tell clients that when I'm in a transaction, there are four people involved in this transaction, each of the parties and each of the lawyers. And all it takes is one of them to be a difficult player to have it go off the rails. Yeah. So if the lawyers can get along, hopefully we can keep things on track and uh, when, when it's going off the track. 
I had a client in a divorce case who was very angry with me because he said he saw me talking to his wife's lawyer in the hallway. And, uh, <laughs> he, he didn't go for that at all. Uh, I, I guess he wanted slings and arrows and all that. So, um, I do have a comment or a question actually from a viewer. Uh, do you have suggestions for maintaining and developing relationships with other attorneys during COVID? Uh, this this uh, viewer says they're the, missing some networking opportunities, uh, mm -hmm. even in seminars like this. And Kathleen, I think you touched on it, the ability to talk to another lawyer and say, hey, have you run into this before? So how, how do you two, um, how are you managing during COVID to, to do that? I guess just pick up the phone and be proactive. Huh? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I wish I had a great answer to that. I don't. I, you know, have a few lawyer, you know, when we talk about marketing in general, people ask these kinds of questions a lot. You know, how do you how do you market? How do you grow your practice? And I always say you just make friends. Um, you know, I think making genuine relationships with people is actually much more, you know, probably the most effective way to do it. But um, so, so for the people that I have those relationships with, it's easier because we're texting each other or we occasionally call. Um, it's really hard to build new relationships now. Um, there aren't a lot of good networking opportunities that I've seen where you can actually meet people as opposed to maybe just interact a little bit with people that you already know. But I know that there are some of those opportunities out there. So some, you know, I'm part of the Dane County Bar Association, the current president, and we still host events. Um, we still, we, you know, we're trying to do all those same kinds of things we did before in a virtual format and even just being part of that and having your face out there and occasionally making comments or contributing is a, is a big part of it. And if you have an opportunity to join something like an ins of court or a board or anything like that, those meetings are still happening. And so you're still having an opportunity to connect with people and, you know, hopefully those connections can continue to grow once, um, once we're out of this hellhole. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I would agree with that, Kathleen. You have to reach out uh, these days because we're not gathering in person. And just to, and it may be just picking up the phone and calling someone with a question uh, or just telling them about something that you have run into so that it, you've got the connection. It, it may be a five minute telephone call. I also find that emails to other lawyers are helpful too. It, it keeps a connection there. So even if it's something unrelated to our particular transaction or estate, that I still have the connection, that they get to know me a little bit. I get to know them. I find that with the clients as well. Uh, because I, I've been at it so long now, I go back to the days where I would meet with the clients a lot during a transaction. And then that dwindled away. Uh, the fax machines and emails took care of that. So that I, it's not uncommon for me to walk into a closing, a residential closing, and my clients don't know what I look like and mm -hmm. I don't know what they look like. And I, I've lost something there. So always looking for how can I um, still connect with the clients. So I try to toss out something personal. If the client has told me about their going to their, their child's concert at school, um, in a follow-up follow email, I'll mention that as we're talking about other things, a follow-up email or telephone call. So you ask that. So there still is that connection because I feel I'm losing that. I'm losing the, 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 the relationship with the client, which used to have greater time to work out. In our August seminar or, or webinar, I guess, uh, there were a couple of lawyers on that webinar that expressed concern that some of these changes that have taken place during the pandemic related to these things will become permanent because of convenience and so forth. And they, they were concerned about that. They didn't like it because of what you both have have said you you lose some things. Uh, do you either of you have concerns about some of the stuff becoming permanent, and we will never get back to kind of some of the things you you talked about? And I, actually, a viewer here just sent in a comment too, saying remote is going to be detrimental for young lawyers because they don't have the opportunity to build relationships mm -hmm. with uh, with with other counsel. Um, I, I think that's probably a valid a valid concern. 
Oh, yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And I, I hope it's for that reason that when we actually are going to sit down, whether it's six months or a year from now to figure out how we're going to operate in a post COVID world, that those kinds of viewpoints have a voice because there's just so much more to the practice than showing up at a hearing or closing a transaction. I mean, it's a relationship business. Um, and a lot of us, you know, get into it because we like working with people and dealing with people. And if you don't like that, uh, then, you know, that <laughs> makes it makes it a lot harder. But if you, you know, there are definitely um, there are definitely issues with being able to get to know your client. Um, and then to, as we were talking about to get to know opposing counsel or just the other side of a transaction that doesn't have to be oppositional, but building those kinds of relationships are so important. And as Mark pointed out, I, I do something very similar where I remember um, Judge Neese once told my partner, Kevin Palmersheim, that you should always be yourself, just less so. And I've um, taken that to heart where I do try to be myself, inject my personality, um, tell personal stories, make jokes with when it's appropriate with people that makes them see you as a human and not just as an opponent or their lawyer who is, you know, and I, I also think, too, it's easy to forget that a lot of people, even sophisticated people, can be somewhat intimidated by lawyers. Um, so if you can set yourself up as someone that is just really there to help them, um, it's so hard to do that virtually. And I think everybody really, you're going to be getting surveys, you're going to get opportunities to let your voice be heard on what the practice of law is going to look like in a post pandemic world. And I think we have to talk about the fact that we need to bring back in person conduct as much as we can. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right, Kathleen. Uh, I was watching on the news the other night, they were talking about how the pandemic and, and the, the massive uh, vaccine effort now has changed things so much in, in that realm of, of vaccines and the, the science of that. Uh, and they related it back to the space program, that the space program, our, our race was to get to the moon, we wanted to beat the Russians, so we poured a lot of effort and money into it. And, and they were making the analogy to dealing now with the pandemic. A lot of money, a lot of effort, everyone went together where there was one goal and how that will change things in the future. That the benefit of the race, to, race in space wasn't that we were all going to go up to the moon, but it was all the, the engineering and science that came from it. And I think there will be things here that after the pandemic mm -hmm. has passed, that we will come to appreciate that it has changed so much now in what we are, what what we have done, and with our connections with our clients. So it's going to be a, a different approach. It's in some ways not as good. In other ways, it'll be an improvement. So I think it's just identifying where those those things are. I know one thing that that I have found when talking about getting getting along with the the um, other attorney. I've, I've often told clients that they come to me as a lawyer because I don't care. And I, then I have to explain that. I care about what happens to you legally, but your transaction, your estate is not my estate. It's not my transaction. And therefore I can be dispassionate and uninvolved. I have no emotional involvement. And that's what the client needs. They need to have that lack of emotional involvement so that you can pull them back from the edge on things so that they understand that this, they, let's, let's let someone who, who is not so directly and emotionally involved uh, make some of the decisions here. Mark, do you find though that, that some clients, they want you to be as passionate about their issues as they are? And if you're not, they view you as uh, less than adequate as a, as a zealous advocate for them? Oh, yeah. They see me as a turncoat. And uh, it's, as you were saying, Tom, how can you talk to the, the, that horrible person who's representing the other side? Um, right. uh, yeah. But I've also seen the clients want us to do that when, when they're not willing to do it themselves. And 
I, I remember sitting in a closing where the parties had not gotten along really well, but we patched it up and got through the closing and the client in the closing is telling the other side, well, you know, I trusted you, but Mark kept telling me things that I needed to do. So we had to do it that way. And, and he's saying this, he's making me out to be the guy with the black hat which was fine. That's part of my role. That's part of what they pay me for. And then on the sidewalk outside the office building is walking away. He tells me, I wouldn't trust that guy from here to the corner. (laughs) (laughs) But I was, I was fulfilling a role and it was one that I was happy to fulfill. I think, I think that kind of comes down to a client management perspective too. When I, you know, when we do litigation intake and somebody's like, I want a bulldog, I want you to raise holy hell, like that's not a good match for me. I mean, no. some people, um, there are lawyers out there who will do that for you and that's great and you should find one of them. Because if, you know, if, if your goal is to just scorch the earth, um, you know, it's a doable thing, you can do it. Most people say they want that, they just don't want to pay for it. But um you know, those, those are the kinds of um, analyses you do when you're kind of doing the intake with it to see if it's a good match. Um, I remember, I don't remember who said this, but someone called it door law, right? You don't want to practice door law. You don't want to take anything that walks in the door because, you know, the, Very good. people are complicated and, and relationships are complicated. And what we do involves a lot of heartache and conflict sometimes. And so you just have to make sure that you're all on the same page before you start that journey together. Yeah. You've hit on Kathleen. I'm sorry, Mark, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that I also have to deal with the matter of principle and you'll hear that. I think we lawyers hear that word principle come up several times a week, every week. And, and I always have to remind the clients that principle is expensive. It's expensive (laughs) financially, but also emotionally. They're putting themselves in this fight. And do they really want to get involved that way? And I have talked so many clients back from that and trying to talk them down when they're saying it's a matter of principle, I want to fight for it. Uh, Sometimes you can get get them uh, roped in quickly by just telling them what the retainer is going to be. (laughs) <laughs> uh, when they're right. ready to fight. But, th- but then also just, I, I find that for myself, I, I'll fight on principle sometimes, rarely though, do I fight all the way on it. So I just do it to remind myself that, okay, I do stand for principle, but it's not worth it for me. And then I, I had a, a matter with a property that, that we own up North and uh, a vacation property. And there was an issue with a neighbor and I was ready to go to the mat. I was ready to fight it. And my my son, who is a lawyer, said, Dad, it's $200. Just pay it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was echoes of me because I have said that sort of thing to so many clients. But I needed that. I needed the, the realistic view. And he gave it to me. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, uh, Kathleen brought up... Uh, you know, the issue of client selection, which I had on my list uh, to talk about, um, as this certainly is part of the whole, the whole picture. Um, and I, you know, I hear from lawyers at various uh, programs that we've done over the years, uh, particularly younger lawyers who, you know, it's difficult to turn business away. You know, you talked about door, door law, Kathleen, and, um, and, and we tell them, you know, uh, and lawyers I, who I've had as speakers on, on some of our panels, uh, Say, you know, sometimes, as you're suggesting, Kathleen, sometimes it's better, you're better off watching that person walk out the door instead of taking on uh, what will turn into a major headache. Uh, You know, we have a saying around Wilmick, uh, how many times have we heard uh, policyholders who who have a a malpractice claim say to us, um, I knew I shouldn't have taken on that client uh, and, and they didn't trust their gut on that and it turns into a problem. Yeah, that's so important. And I spent a lot of the early years of my practice, as a lot of us probably do, especially in smaller and mid-sized firms where you get some kind of wacky stuff or other things where, you know, people want to fight for the principle of the thing or whatever it is. And you think, ah, oh, yeah, I'll do that. Um, but you start to realize early on, hopefully, that the especially when it comes to conflict matters or litigation, um, 
it almost never gets better. So if, if, if it's difficult at the beginning, it yeah. always gets worse because litigation has so many hills and valleys and there's always that moment, no matter how much you like the client and they like you, where they say, how come I'm the only one answering discovery? Or when are you going to do this? It's like, well, this is the process. Like you have to do these things. Um, so you really have to evaluate whether or not the client is someone that you can really go the distance with, if it's going to be a longer term type matter or something that involves litigation in particular, um, because though it just, it always gets harder. And in fact, I did just recently um, on a pre-litigation basis, um, terminate a client relationship because the client wasn't very communicative. They had very unrealistic expectations. um, And I just knew that would get harder. And I, you know, it, life is hard enough right now. We just really can't take on those things because then, you know, when it comes to, to um, thinking about the ethical considerations and malpractice claims, when the client is really difficult, you will procrastinate on talking to them and you will procrastinate on doing their work because we all do that when it's hard and when you don't like the person and in those kinds of things. And so, um, those those kinds of things come together to make a really bad situation. It's just better to nip it early on. I I have found that we, uh, that door law with do you let them in the door or not, um, it, which is great. I'm going to remember that. And <laughs> with the the um, the clients, get, if you get the sense that it just doesn't feel right, you know, to go with your gut on that. Um, I, I've had a number of clients when they've had a difficult transaction at the end said, you know, I just felt there was going to be trouble with this guy. <laughs> and also, you didn't tell me that. Why, did, why didn't you raise that at the beginning? And, and if there's something there, because so often we can't put our finger on it. We can't say what it is, but there's something that's giving us some warning signs. And I always say, go with your gut on that. There's something that is, is telling you that you shouldn't, because I don't think in most cases, it's very clear um, why you're, you're just feeling ill at ease with a particular client or particular matter. Uh, and, and you should just go with that feeling. Something is telling you that. Yeah, uh, just to, bouncing back just briefly, I, we have a comment from a viewer that said, uh, I have also had clients complain that their attorney had coffee afterwards with the other attorney. I always give them the following example. I play a lot of sports. If I was playing for the city basketball championship and a good friend of mine was on the other team, I'm going to play just as hard or maybe even harder, but I will still go out and have a beer with him after. I explain that just because an attorney has a cup of coffee with the other attorney does not mean that he is uh, not going to try his hardest in the courtroom. This is their livelihood and the fact that they know the other lawyer will not change how hard they fight for their clients which is all true. Uh, I think sometimes clients have trouble hearing that uh, or or they just don't believe it or or something. But anyway, comment from a And I would just say sometimes when I have a good relationship with opposing counsel or on a transactional matter, um, it actually is better for the clients because we can usually work stuff out. Or, you know, I had a case last year that absolutely should have settled it was a very absurd, difficult case in federal court. It was quickly getting very expensive. In my opinion, opposing counsel was kind of being a jerk, but I happened to know someone else on their litigation team who wasn't as involved, but he and I were friends. And I called him and I said, hey, you're in this case. I know you haven't been on a lot of these emails. Can you help me get this back on track? I don't know what's happening with your partner. This is going a little bit off the rails. How do we get these people back to where we need them to be. And that frankly is what it took to get the case settled and resolved. But had I not, you know, had there not been a relationship there, I would have just, it would have just continued to devolve into more motion practice and people fighting about things. Um, And that was better for everybody. Yeah. And that's all more costly to the client. Right. Yeah. I think when the, when the clients uh, are upset, if they see you having coffee, um, or if they happen to see you out on the sidewalk talking with the other lawyer um, and they raise that, I always like to point out, no, this is to your advantage that we know one another. Uh, when I, I always say when I have a, a, a new transaction come in and I'll ask who the lawyer is on the other side 
And I have one of two responses. Either it's, oh, good, even if there's a problem, we'll be able to work it out. Or, oh, no, not that guy. There's <laughs> going to be a problem even if there isn't one. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hey, I just want to bounce back before we leave the, uh, the, the court operations during COVID. Uh, I had one other question for both of you, and that is, have you seen COVID-related delays in some of your cases? And if so, um, A, have they come from the courts? Or B, have they come from other places? And uh, a follow-up to that is, have courts been flexible uh, in, in dealing with delays? Um, federal court, in my opinion, no. They have not been flexible. Um, I had a client sanctioned for asking to delay discovery due to covid with a pending motion to dismiss and the, the, all of the clients were dismissed three weeks afterwards, but um, they had very little sympathy or concern for the fact that all of our records were paper records. And it was in March during the serious lockdown when you weren't going in and they did not particularly care. Uh, state court has been a, a different animal. They are, have been much more flexible in my experience. And there have been a lot of delays from the courts. Um, frankly, all I had four jury trials scheduled between January and April, three of which I expected to go, all of which have been rescheduled. So in Dane County, at least, they are basically taking all juries, civil juries off the calendars um, through July, at least and rescheduling them for late in the fall. So, uh, and frankly, that will probably get pushed too, because we're just dealing with, you know, the, the criminal cases need to get on. We have speedy trial issues there. And so um, those things are just, are delayed. And I also don't know that the state courts um, in a lot of counties have a great protocol yet for in-person jury trials, although maybe there are criminal people, uh, criminal defense or prosecutors that can speak to that more that would have seen it. Bench trials, however, are happening and they are happening via Zoom. So I have a bench scheduled in May that I expect to happen and that's great, but everything else, it's it's delays from the courts um, for sure. Yeah. But, but discovery issues, I mean, I've found that you have to be really careful when you're saying and I will say some of this comes from a client control perspective too, because clients, nobody wants to deal with discovery. It's terrible. Clients don't want to deal with it. And they're going to say, well, you know, we have all these delays because of COVID, but you better make darn sure that's a legitimate argument because I have, the courts have not been universally forgiving there. So um, it's easy to, I think they're starting to see it as sort of an easy give when you just want to delay discovery issues. Cause that's what people want to do. But you still got to be really diligent there um, and make sure that when the client's telling you they can't do it because of COVID, that that's not just because they don't want to deal with it. Yeah. I, I have an estate now that's, that's pending and it's been a battle between two siblings um, and, and I'm representing one. The other one is represented by another lawyer. Uh, I wish that we were in court because I think it's been too easy for them to fight. And it would be so much better if we were in the courtroom and the judge telling them what they needed to do. It helped a bit that we had a Zoom hearing with the judge. We were working with the registrar and probate. He was doing as much as he could. But once we got to the court, then the, the client, both, both of the clients began paying a, a little bit more attention to it and seeing that they had to be a little bit more reasonable in working things out. So I think that's helpful. Where I've had a couple of problems is with delays. One right now, there's the CDC has a moratorium on evictions. So that's been a problem. That's going to be, it's going to fill the courts in January when the moratorium ends. Although I'm not so sure the moratorium is going to be lifted. It would not surprise me that they wouldn't extend that moratorium a bit, getting us into the new year. Um, but that's a problem for my, my clients who they have to pay their mortgage, they have to pay the taxes, they have to pay the insurance, and there's no um, rent coming in. Uh, and I understand the reason for the moratorium, but that's been an issue. Another area where I have had uh, problems lately is with the IRS issuing um, the, the 
federal employer ID number for new entities. And they're not, yeah, they're not issuing, it's, it's very much delayed. And I, I spoke with a representative of, of the IRS after an hour and 10 minutes on hold, but eventually I got through and she was very helpful. And she said, I used to work, I was a paralegal before coming here. And I know we used to get these numbers. So I understand what you're dealing with, but they got backlogged with the pandemic. I mean, you didn't have the people on staff that were at work in the spring. So that backed up. We were already delayed on those. But I, I've have, I have a couple of clients who have businesses where they need that number. And we're being told four months before we're going to get an ID number. That's a problem for a new business. We need those numbers. Yeah. We have a question from a viewer. Uh, the question is, any information on how many lawyers are leaving the practice or closing offices due to the changes in practicing law due to COVID? Um, I don't have any, and I don't know if either of you have thoughts on it. I know, Kathleen, in your outline, you cited a Clio uh, survey that showed uh, new matters dipping in April down 30%, um, slowly rising in the summer, but, but still down, and that billing volume uh, in May was down 23%. This is from your outline, which was really good. And I had jotted down in my, in my notes to, to talk a little bit about this. And so as long as we have a, a viewer question, uh, maybe we can take this up. Uh, I don't have statistics in Wisconsin on lawyers who have left practice. I could give some anecdotal information that I hear from lawyers and maybe, maybe either of you have, have some of that too. Well, I'm planning on working another couple of months at least. So how about you, Kathleen? You too. <laughs> yeah. I'm ready to retire, Mark, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to hang it up yet. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. That Clio Impact Survey. Anybody can um, obtain it online. And there's a if you look up Clio COVID Impact Survey on Google, there's a lot of good information out there. I didn't drill down specifically on whether or not lawyers were leaving the practice. I expect we'll see some, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Some delayed response on that essentially, because a lot of people are probably just hanging on a little bit to see if things pick back up and, and they, they will almost certainly, but the, the overriding question is always, are they going to pick up in sectors where you can actually make a living helping these people? Um, because of course, paying for legal services is, always an issue and there's a lot of need out there that goes unfulfilled yet at the same time lawyers of course have to make a living so um you know i think over overall we're seeing dips in in both oh kathleen froze <laughs> all right we'll see if we can get her back all right Anecdotally, I think oh, the new matter thing is 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 a little more nuanced because I am sometimes talking people out of filing litigation right now unless they really really need to because what the hell are you going to do sit and wait for two years before you get a trial because that's really what we're looking at so you better you're better off focusing on trying to resolve problems outside of litigation right now than you are filing new cases because you're not going to get into court anytime soon. So, um, and, and in my experience, delays always make for more inefficiency. Um, so, you know, it's going to be more expensive, essentially. So I think the new matter thing can be, you know, nuanced a little bit there. But overall, I'm sure we'll see some smaller firms or, or solo practitioners, um, you know, leave the practice because it's just, it's tough out there. Kathleen, have you seen more mediations and arbitrations because of the delay in getting into the courts? Yeah, I would say yes. I would say there's an increased pressure to do that. Um, and I am certainly raising that often with my clients because you say, you you know, we're if we're on the plaintiff side, you say you need this resolved. I'm telling you that ain't going to happen for a while. So we might as well sit down and talk about trying to resolve it. And I will say also, I've been pleasantly surprised at how effective virtual mediations have been. I've mm. had three of them and two of them resolved in settled matters. So, um, you know, that, that surprised me actually, because if anything requires in-person nuance, it's mediation. 
I have been a big fan of mediation. I've seen it work with my clients uh, so well. Most of the cases do resolve. I've sat as a mediator a couple of times and it's just, it's helpful. And, and what it does is give the clients uh, an independent perspective. And it often it's the, the mediator saying the same thing I've been saying to the client along the way, but it, it just validates what I've been saying, the, the strengths and weaknesses of their case, because they all think they've got a great case, which is human nature that we would do that. But it's, yeah, they, they all have that, that expectation that everything is great on their side. Uh, I, I often say that with the, um, with comparing lawyers and physicians, physicians deal with human uh, frailty. So they'll always have business. We deal with human nature. So we'll always have business as well. It's going to be there. We're dealing with humans. They will disagree. They will have their fights. They will have their suspicions about others. So the business will be there. It's a question of where it will be. Um, and, and that's always changing. Uh, I'll just uh, weigh in here real quick uh, to the viewer's question about uh, lawyers leaving the practice. What Some of what we have seen, uh, not necessarily lawyers leaving the practice, but um, lawyers leaving bigger firms and starting up smaller firms, either solo offices mm -hmm. or lawyer uh, offices of two or three. We, we've seen some of that, um, but I, I can't speak to whether... We've seen uh, large scale uh, law firms closing up or, or lawyers leaving the practice, at least in Wisconsin. I, I've actually in many cases seen the opposite, um, some solos that are, that are doing quite well um, mm -hmm. during COVID. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure why. I, I wish I had better statistics on that, but, but I don't. Um, okay, uh, I want to, I, I also had in my notes, uh, I wanna talk about employment law a little bit. I, I had jotted down uh, something that I've seen a lot of lately uh, reading about this stuff, and that is um, talking about mask mandates and social distancing uh, as those restrictions impact businesses and specifically their employee handbooks and, and policies and things of that nature. You both, I, I think, have certainly represented businesses. Um, and we, we have a question from a viewer along those lines. Uh, that, that's similar to some of the notes I had. And that is, uh, here's the question, flagging an issue for employers and employees council for 2021 documentation of vaccine for workers. Will courts and law offices want proof of vaccine for in-person access? So let's start there. Before we talk about businesses, handbooks and, and those sorts of things, um, do either one of you want to weigh in on uh, this question? Will courts and law offices want proof of vaccine for in-person access? In-person access to offices or? Um, yeah, it sounds like offices and, and courts, you know, mm. courtrooms. Um, and this, I think, is down the road, of course, once they, once we get to more in-person hearings and those sorts of things and, and things start to open up and the vaccine is, is out there. I, this is um, a question that to me, it, it's a good question, but it's down the road. It, it's so difficult to project ahead. I mean, the vaccine just, just got sent out yesterday. We're months and months away, I think, from uh, wide wide scale vaccine. But um, but the question is, what do you think will what will we see with courts? Uh, will people need proof of vaccination uh, to get into courtrooms, uh, uh, into into law firms? Uh, it's a tough one. I know. I, yeah. I, Go ahead, Mark. You know, I I have an idea of how we can encourage people to get the vaccine because that's a concern. We have to get to a, a certain level where we get the herd uh, uh, immunity. And I think rather than people saying, well, I've had it, when you get the vaccine, you should get a certificate saying that you've been vaccinated. And that will help open up the restaurants and the bars. You don't get in unless you've got that certificate. Now that's just Mark Young's harebrained idea, but I think will, it, it, will, you could use will, that in the courts too. I was going to say, will our courtrooms, will that apply to courtrooms? Do you think? I, I would love to see it. You know, mm -hmm. when we come in, we have to show a certificate in any place and it would push people to get the, va the vaccination. And gr because there has to be a great deal of trust here that the people around me have gotten the vaccination 
Um, and, but, you know, again, that's my harebrained idea. I think that can, I, I mean, that certainly could encourage people, obviously. That I think it's unlikely we'll see that as a requirement to access courts just because I don't know how you, how you really do that because people are, you know, have a right to access and, and if they will wear a mask or socially distance or do some of the other things that we know work, um, will that be sufficient? I certainly could see, um, I, I mean, I know every year in healthcare industries requirements to get the flu vaccine often cause a little bit of a kerfuffle as a condition of employment. And generally speaking, you can do that in those environments. So my, you know, there probably will be some larger private firms or businesses that will want to impose these requirements. And I think that's an issue that's going to be litigated. Um, you know, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. But I, I, I mean, this is just my personal opinion. I don't necessarily see a requirement that you have to prove that you've been vaccinated before you can um, access the courts or, or anything else. But um, that would be a good motivator. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, here's a viewer comment that just came in. We don't yet know whether vaccination will prevent transmission. For now, people getting vaccinated will still need to mask until we have more data. I right. think that's a good that's a good point. Yeah. Um, so vaccination, not necessarily the uh, the, the silver bullet. Um, and then uh, employee handbooks, uh, businesses uh, policies. How do you think that will? be impacted you know when you when you are representing businesses as we get into i don't know march april may uh you know how how is how are we going to and businesses are opening more and so forth um what what do you think the impact will be on uh employers handbooks and and policies and that sort of thing regarding masks and social distancing i i i don't practice employment law but i would think it'd be a reasonable requirement of an employer that um, the, the, their employees, especially if they're in, in contact with the public a great deal, would, would have to be uh, vaccinated. Right. That, that raises other issues then too. What if someone is opposed to uh, vaccines uh, or they have religious objections? There are all sorts of issues which can arise from that, which as Kathleen said, probably have to be litigated yeah. So I've been um, for larger employers that I represent, I have been advising them to put in place written policies on mask use and other things. Some of it is because in Dane County and other places we we do have, you know, of course, as everyone knows, the government regulations on pandemic response are hodgepodge. You've got municipal, you've got some counties and not others, some states and not others. So it's it's tricky, and this is some an area where it's petering off a little bit, but early on and throughout the summer, we saw a lot of this where people were calling with a lot of questions on how to deal with this, particularly larger employers. So creating written policies, I think, is always a better way to go because you can create clarity, you can, um, you can have specific expectations in place. And of course, as Mark pointed out, there are going to need to be some exceptions. Um, and, you know, even in the um, mask mandates themselves, there are built in accommodations that have you have to be able to accommodate employees, you have to be able to accommodate um, patrons, clients, that sort of thing. So there's always going to be that gray area that will have to be litigated or, or worked through. But for most people in most situations, Ha, you know, we have been revising handbooks or helping create written policies on this because it's just, it's just more important, I think, to create some certainty in this world of uncertainty right now um, for, you know, both of our clients and, of course, for our own firms. Yeah, um, I just want to jump back. I, a couple of comments from viewers uh, regarding the vaccination requirement, if there were such a thing um, for courthouses and other places. Uh, the uh, viewer says, are you saying employers such as schools can legally require COVID vaccines? Uh, and then a follow-up to that is, um, uh, this other viewer says that there's zero chance. They, they believe that it would only be applicable with private concerns. Um, yeah. Thoughts on that? Yeah. I don't think right now, 
and, and this is a little bit outside my area, so I don't want to speak out of school, so to speak, but um, I don't think as it stands right now that they could require everyone to get a vaccine that works in schools. Generally, where that becomes a big issue is in hospitals where nurses and doctors are, are have been required in the past and can, will continue to be required to have the flu vaccine, for example. And that is generally... Uh, permissible uh, for the, for that to be a condition of employment. I, you know, I think this is just going to have to be, if certain school districts try to impose something like that, you're likely going to see some litigation um, to try to resolve that question. As it sits right now, no, I don't think schools can require that as a condition of employment. But if someone has a different opinion or, or wanted to talk about that, I'd, you know, be interesting conversation. Yeah, I think I think a couple of the comments here from viewers are are similar to what you're what you're saying, Kathleen. Um, okay, um, I, I want to jump back a little bit. Uh, we were talking about uh, the COVID impact uh, again on on the client expectations. So, uh, I guess why is my question? Why why are clients approaching their legal issues differently during COVID? What is it about the pandemic? Is it just the, the stress level is higher or what is it that is, is causing so many clients to put more pressure on their, on their attorneys or, or ramp up expectations? Well, I find it varies so much by the client. I mean, I've had, I met with a client a while back. He needed to sign a document to close out an estate and I, he was very reluctant to come into the office. So I went and met him in the parking lot and he had his mask on and then he had the shield down as well. Well, I, I know he has some underlying health problems. So I understand that. On the other hand, I've had clients come in and at the end of the meeting, out comes their hand, they're going to shake my hand. <laughs> so I, you know, I tend to go along with it and then go wash my hands very quickly afterwards. But that, so it just depends. I've had clients who just, they think it's, it's all a hoax. They're not going to pay any attention to it. They think it's been overblown. Um, so you have those who are very concerned and those who have no concern at all with the bulk of the people, I think in the middle where realistically saying there, there is an issue here. We need to be uh, concerned about it. I found also there's a, a difference by age of the clients uh, on, on, in several respects. One is the older they are, the more concerned they are about the, the health consequence. Uh, the, the younger they are, and I was the same way at that age, I'm invincible. It's not going to get me. Um, the other thing is, in we're talking about communication, that the younger clients are very adept at the virtual communication. They're not thrown by it all. Uh, the older clients, um, not to stereotype, but uh, they're not as wired as the younger uh, clients are. So it's, that's an, an adjustment. Um, they're ones that still, they're reluctant to come in, but they have to come in because they're not connected. So that, that's been an adjustment um, and, and I don't know how that will change. I expect there are many who were not connected that much before. Now they have been, and it'll be an expectation going forward that they can connect that way. Um, I certainly agree with all of that. That's, you know, just trying to set your own boundaries while also being flexible to some extent to um, accommodate people. We also just dealt with a lot of, so for, in my practice, we worked with a lot of clients, working them through the PPP loan process, all the new employment rules and regulations. A lot of people early on that were doing layoffs and figuring out the best way to do that. Um, and then dealing, of course, with the emergency family and medical leave act expansion, um, helping employees deal with their childcare issues and what that means for, um, you know, can you terminate them if they can't come into work or they need to come into work and what are the boundaries around that now? And, and, in I mean, frankly, from my perspective, there are still a lot of unanswered questions on how some of that stuff should apply. It seems like overall, most employers that I have worked with have tried 
to err on the side of being flexible and helpful. But if they wanted to take a harder line on something, they want to know what the boundaries of the rules are. And the, the expectation of clients is that we know what those are. And frankly, we don't always right now. Um, for something like FMLA, we have years and years of administrative guidance and case law to tell us what it means. But for some of these newer rules, we don't have any of that. And when it comes to something like the PPP, the SBA is seemingly every week issuing new differing regulations. So um, clients are panicking a little bit because they, especially the more sophisticated ones, feel like they know how to terminate an employee or address an employee request for an accommodation. But now there's this whole new layer of complexity that they don't know how to deal with. And they need us to help them. And they need us to help them quickly. And and they're also, you know, there's news reports everywhere. There's blog posts. There's the internet telling them all these things. So working through that complexity really has been a challenge. Um, it's been a challenge in our office in part, you know, if you're in a really large firm, it's one thing because you probably have young associates or staff that can really just dig down into these issues and deal with it. But in smaller to mid-sized firms, it's just us trying to figure it out as we go question by question. And that's, it's a tough expectation in, in these times. Yeah. Kathleen, I, I, when I was looking at your uh, outline over the weekend, uh, one thing I jotted down was the, the what, what you, you uh, inspired in me, the thought about with talk of FMLA um, protections and the expansion of those, uh, that child care and sick leave now are, are up front and, and center. I mean, those are, those are real issues now for so many families that it, they weren't issues for them before. And, and they right. weren't, these families aren't prepared for that sort of thing. And maybe their lawyers aren't either. I don't know. Right. So, so that's, that's the interesting thing is we're advising clients, but we're also dealing with it with our own staff internally. And I have an elementary school age kid at home and, you know, I can't, we're, we're just juggling all of that and trying to figure it out as we go. So I think, you know, for the, for the lawyers and the law firms, we have to figure out how we're going to be flexible while also still abiding by our ethical duties on confidentiality and all of those things. And I put some of that in the outline, but for the clients um, it's, it's the same thing. And, you know, the clients themselves and their employees have kids at home and what are we all going to do about that? Um, it just requires a lot of grace and flexibility, I think. Yeah. Um, I, we have about uh, three minutes to go on the first session. And I, I have a question from a viewer that I'll pose to both of you. Um, do you think lawyers can be required to get vaccinated given that we were designated essential workers? <laughs> good <laughs> it's a tough question. One. Yeah, it is a good question. I don't have the answer. Do you? I, no, I don't. Never, I right. don't have the answer, but I'm going to venture to guess no. Okay. That would be my, you know, some exceptions may be made for, you know, criminal defense attorneys that are going into jails or prisons, for example. I mean, I could see maybe more of a gray area there. Man, this is uncharted territory. I honestly don't know. For your average workaday run of the mill lawyer, my instinct on that would be no. All right. I would agree. Okay. Uh, well, with about a minute and a half to go, uh, any closing thoughts from, from either of you? How maybe ideas or advice on how uh, lawyers can navigate all this stuff as we kind of work our way through COVID and hopefully out of it uh, in the very near future? I, I would say that take the clue from the client as far as how we relate with them during the pandemic. Um, what are their expectations? What are their concerns? And I think we just need to adapt and adjust to those concerns, which is easily said not as easily done. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I would add um, being able to manage those expectations ahead of time. If you have issues timely responding because of your own childcare situations or whatever is going on in your own life, communicating about that within reason is important and appropriate. I think I'm doing that now with my own clients. So, and, and that also comes um, to bear with the last thought which is everybody should just take care of themselves. I mean, this is a really hard time. We're going into a hard few months. All of us have pretty hard and stressful jobs. And I think trying to focus on taking care of yourself will also help clients. Excellent. Uh, 
Mark, Kathleen, I want to thank you both very much for taking part in this this morning. This was a great discussion. Uh, we didn't solve the world's problems, but we uh, we certainly covered some some good stuff. I hope uh, our viewers uh, it sparked some thoughts for them and things they can take back uh, to their practices. So uh, thank you both very much, uh, very much appreciated. Thank uh, you for inviting thanks, us. Norman. Thanks, everyone. You bet. Thank you. Uh, all right, ten fifteen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will take a fifteen minute break. Uh, we will be back at ten thirty with uh, session number two. Thank you.
All right, 10.30 on the button, we're back. Uh, thanks to all of you who are sticking with us this morning. We very much appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed the first session uh, where we talked about boy, a variety of topics, um, but mostly um, you know, managing client expectations and how to deal with COVID issues uh, in, in your practice. Um, session two, we're gonna shift a little bit um, while we will continue to talk about some of those issues. Um, now we're gonna talk more about um, how handling those issues or maybe mishandling them can turn into an OLR complaint or even a malpractice claim. And uh, we have two terrific uh, speakers today, experts who can help you uh, figure out how those navigation systems work and um, what you can do about that if you find yourself in that situation. And most importantly, how you can avoid getting into them in the first place. Uh, Stacy Rosenzweig is with us. She's a partner with the law firm of Haling and Ko in Milwaukee. Uh, Stacy's practice emphasizes representation of regulated professionals, including lawyers and healthcare professionals, facing possible disciplinary action by licensing authorities, as well as ethics and compliance counseling. Stacy graduated from Marquette University Law School, summa cum laude, second in her class with pro bono honors. And while at Marquette, she served as a note and comment editor for Marquette Law Review. So we're very happy to have Stacy with us. Also, uh, Matt Beyer, he is business development manager and claims attorney with Wisconsin Lawyers Mutual Insurance Company. Matt provides professional claim service to all of our insured lawyers at Wilmick. He works to investigate, evaluate, and resolve claims as efficiently as possible. Prior to November of 2016, when Matt joined Wilmick, uh, he was a civil litigation attorney in Madison with experience before state and federal courts, as well as Wisconsin administrative agencies. Matt is a 1996 graduate of South Dakota State University, where he also played on the football team. He has a degree there from, uh, in political science. He then graduated from the University of Wisconsin Law School in the year 2000. So Matt and Stacy, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, I look forward to getting your expertise on the many issues we talked about in the first session, uh, we solved nothing. And so, uh, but we, but we certainly, we, we certainly came up with some interesting thoughts on how to maybe navigate those things and, and deal with them. Um, very, uh, you know, difficult and complex issues, especially now during the pandemic. Um, so Stacy, I'll start with you. I'm sure that with the pandemic, um, you're probably seeing things uh, in the OLR area that maybe you hadn't seen before and, and, Probably unique. Well, uh, right now, uh, discipline and grievances are actually a bit of a lagging indicator. So um, a lot of what's happening now in the disciplinary arena are, are, are stems from issues that happened six months ago, a year ago, two years ago. And we're only now starting to see a little bit of the pandemic creep into complaints. Um, we haven't seen any, uh, to my knowledge, there has not been public discipline that directly uh, uh, implicates the pandemic, which again makes sense because of just how long it takes for a matter to go through the system. Um, I actually took a look at this, uh, I think yesterday or the day before, the OLR has a compendium of discipline online where you can search by keywords, search by uh, rule violation and find public discipline plus summaries of uh, private discipline that take, uh, take out identifying details. And I just, I looked up the word pandemic and there was a total of one hit for pandemic and it just dealt with the date of the order. It was a Supreme Court opinion saying we're going to uh, retroactively impose discipline because it took us a little longer than it normally would have to um, decide this due to the pandemic. Um, so that's something to watch out for. I know in the last session uh, delays were discussed and the Supreme Court is not, is uh, no exception. Um, but what I am starting to see in complaints that come in and in disciplinary matters I'm handling um, are uh, where, where the pandemic does come up, um, it does tend to be uh, delays. It tends to be uh, 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 the fact that uh, lawyers haven't gotten back to their clients, the fact that, um, uh, in, in, you know, and I, I'm mindful of the fact that I'm not going to be talking anything, any identifying details about anybody. Um, I'm speaking in very broad general generalities and hypotheticals here. If you think um, you recognize yourself, trust me, you don't. I may have a couple, for all I know, I have a couple clients in the audience. I don't have a list, um, but I wanna, uh, I wanna make it clear I'm not talking about you. Um, 
But in any case, I'm, I am seeing uh, certain things involving delays. I'm also seeing some employment related grievances uh, where employees, because um, anybody can file a grievance against a lawyer, it doesn't have to be a current or former client. And I'm seeing a couple, I've had a couple that involve employees um, who uh, have, have filed grievances against their lawyer or against their former boss um, for maltreatment, perhaps uh, uh, alleging harassment based on sex uh, gender, race, et cetera, uh, where that's, um, that is a prohibited practice um, for lawyer, both in employment law and in, uh, and in, in the ethical rules. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's, I am seeing that being kind of couched in pandemic terms. Well, this person let me go and the pretext was we don't have enough work to do because of the pandemic, but really I think it was because of my gender. Um, stuff like that. So it'll actually be a little bit before we see how this shakes out, um, both in terms of complaints and also I think in terms of malpractice claims, um, because again, people have three years to file a malpractice claim, six years to file a breach of contract claim. And a lot of times people do wait until the very end of that period to, to start making noise, um, which I'm sure Matt might be able to speak a little more to on that, but um, it's going to be wait and see. Yeah, I, I can agree with that, Stacey. The uh hasn't been, uh, we've been asked several times to sort of forecast, um, you know, what kinds of claims we're going to see if there's going to be an increase, even just you know, general questions like that. And uh, frankly, I have not fielded a, a claim call um, for anything necessarily related to the pandemic. In other words, an issue, uh, like you mentioned, delays, and that can be in communication, that can also be in, you know, deadlines, um, court deadlines, or something like that. Uh, where the lawyer has missed a date. Uh, although some of those things may indirectly be related to the pandemic, they were certainly problems that existed beforehand. Um, but on the other hand, um, we do have, you know, sort of this new uh, tension, this new uh, area of argument. Hey Matt, your, your volume is kind of going in and out uh, a little bit. Sometimes it takes my microphone a bit to warm up. Uh, I don't okay. know why that is, um, but uh, I'll definitely try to use my outside voice. Um, the, uh, and, and what I was saying was that we, we do have new areas of argument um, that, that may be direct, well, are directly related to the pandemic. For example, I did field a call from one of our insured attorneys uh, where he described an argument that he got in at a local grocery store about some individuals who were not wearing masks and should have been. Um, you know, I, I think those kinds of confrontations um, are, are going to be more likely to occur um, and they don't necessarily involve, um, uh, you know, your status as a lawyer, um, you know, but it, because somebody knows you're a lawyer, could it lead to uh, a grievance being filed? Yeah, it, it probably could. Um, so uh, it is something to be aware of. And, uh, you know, I did like uh, Kathleen's closing statement, which was, you know, just everybody stay well. Um, and, and I think that means, you know, mental health concerns also, um, you know, keep yourself on as, as even a keel as you can uh, so that you can deliver professional services in the way that you expect of yourself and the way that your clients expect of you. Stacy, um, so what 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 should lawyers be on the lookout for? What what uh, what what kinds of um uh, things should be, they be kind of putting in place for themselves in their practice to, to try to avoid, you know, getting into a situation where uh, an unhappy client uh, uh, brings an OLR complaint. I, and that's uh, easier said than done, of course, but. Uh, right. Yeah. And um, as I, as I said earlier, uh, keep in mind the barrier to filing an OLR complaint is very, very low that it doesn't require a fee you don't have to get a lawyer to do it. Um, anybody with you know a, a sheet of notebook paper and a red crayon can make a paper airplane and send it through the door of the OLR and 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 file a grievance. Um, but you're right. Unhappy clients are more likely to file grievances than happy ones. In fact, I'm not really sure I've ever seen a happy client file a grievance. Although you know who knows. Um, I, I I think this is um, this is an issue that the pandemic has um, exacerbated, but it hasn't um, fundamentally changed. And um, communication with your client is key. Um, one of the things that I see a lot of in grievances is again, my, my 
my attorney didn't send this to me, didn't explain this to me properly, didn't keep up with the case in a timely fashion. So communication and diligence were both issues. And at least, you know, in my personal experience, in the anecdotal experience of others I've talked to, that's become just a lot harder to do right now. And I know it was referred to in the earlier panel, the idea that um, we're balancing a lot of things right now. We've got uh, my, my fifth grader is um, writing a report on the Ho-Chunk tribe downstairs and is not happy about it based on some of the groaning I can hear even now. Um, so we're balancing ho- uh, virtual schooling, the distractions of home, um, not having our assistants or our paralegals in, in the same building as we are to um, keep us on task um, and and things like that. So it becomes a little harder to um, just keep up with, uh, with everything. And I, I think the advice given on the last panel was a good one. Just make sure that you do, even if you can't substantively, substantively respond to your client, um, just let them know that you received the inf- the email or the message and that you'll get back to them. Give them a, a reasonable time frame to do it. Uh, what might have been reasonable a year ago, I will, you know, people have lofty goals of I will return everybody's call um, the same day or I will within 24 hours. Um, that may or may not be realistic now, but make sure you communicate those expectations um, as we go for as as you go forward. Um, I've found that. Um, uh, the outcome of the case is not determinative of whether it ends up in a grievance. It's the fact that the outcome was um, perhaps foreseeable and well communicated. So a bad outcome isn't necessarily going to draw a grievance. Um, if you do communicate, you know, manage your client's expectations early on and then communicate through the representation that, you know, hey, this isn't, this may not go as you would like it. I can try, make sure you just keep, um, keep that up. And then when it does come time to deliver bad news, if there is time to deliver bad news, make sure that's done promptly in terms that your client can understand. Any alternatives, ways to mitigate are clearly communicated. And I've found that even when the outcome isn't, isn't great, if that, if all of those things fall into place, the client is less likely to blame you for the bad outcome and file a grievance against you or sue you for malpractice. They're more likely to accept that that was, um, a known risk of going forward or um, a likelihood of going forward in some cases and uh, move on. Yeah, I, I, know, I was going to say, Matt, I know you have some thoughts on this managing expectations. Always um, the, the over-promising and under-delivering is, is uh, almost the sure recipe for disaster, correct? Yeah, you bet. And I, you know, I think just to refer to the materials that everyone has, you know, I, I chose the phrase begin with the end in mind. Um, you know, set the tempo early, set expectations early, uh, which gets to Stacy's point. I think a lawyer's first opportunity to do that. Well, I should, I should uh, follow up on um, Kathleen's comment and, and Mark's comment in the first session where they, they talked about door law. You know, are you even going to let this person in the door uh, and, and, and represent them uh, as a client or as a lawyer? Um, you know, I think once you let them in the door, one of your first opportunities to communicate with your client, uh, you know, is the fee agreement. And there, there are a lot of things that the fee agreement uh, can be used, uh, you know, by way of a vehicle to communicate those things uh, and really ought to be um, done well. Um, and, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and, and read one of the quotes that I got from Stacy for an article that, that we wrote uh, once upon a time. And it's, you know, fee disputes often morph into an OLR complaint. And uh, Stacy says, in her experience, fee, fee disputes arise when the matter doesn't go as the clients hoped. Um, they lost at trial. Their sale didn't close. Their matter took months longer than expected. So managing expectations from the start is important. And you're exactly right, Stacy. If they know, you know, that their case isn't a slam dunk, like they thought when they came into your office, uh, if they know that ahead of time, then they will have clear expectations or they'll have at least realistic expectations. Um, And if they know ahead of time, because you explained your fee agreement to them uh, and you communicated clearly to them um, the way that you were going to bill and how expensive you are, um, you know, then I think that they at least understand, you know, that, okay, well, I knew this going in and I made the decision anyways, you know, here I am. You know, and if it's a good result, great, then you're right. 
there's not likely to be a grievance or a claim um, or anything of that nature. But um, if if they don't feel like they knew uh, what was what could happen, uh, and they feel blindsided, they feel you know I think uh, reactionary. And and one of the easiest ways, as Stacy mentioned, is is to file a grievance. You don't you know uh, attorney client relationship uh, is usually. Uh, the underlying relationship that leads to a grievance, but anybody who feels wronged by something that the attorney did can can certainly bring that to OLR's attention. And I will say, too, and I underline it in our, in our materials on page one there, that over 20% of our claims reported are a result of poor attorney-client communications. Um, and I wanted to take a minute just to clarify that um, Claims that are reported to, to Wilmick, um, you know, I, I use the, taint, the term claims there in, in the materials, um, but there are basically three areas where we expect as a malpractice carrier, uh, our insured attorneys to communicate or report to us. Uh, and that's, you know, one is a claim. That's the obvious one uh, where the client says, hey, you did something wrong. I'm going to sue you. Um, the, a potential claim are just a set of facts and circumstances that a reasonably prudent attorney would uh, realize could give rise to a claim crap, I missed the deadline. Um, you know, it's not yet a claim because I haven't told the client, but, um, you know, it's a, definitely a potential claim. I better report it. And then the third is a grievance. And um, grievances aren't necessarily something that would uh, result in any sort of indemnity payment from Wilmick, uh, but they are uh, facts and circumstances that Wilmick wants to be aware of um, from a malpractice carrier's perspective. Uh, and so those grievances, as it's defined in the Supreme Court rules, um, you know, in other words, a, a, a complaint about an attorney made to OLR, um, those are things that we do expect uh, to be reported um, so that we can try and help fix it if possible. And if not, we can get you in touch with good people like Stacy that can represent you in those grievances. Yeah, Matt, uh, you, you mentioned page one of the outline, and I, I guess I wanted to go there a little bit. Um, we might as well start with fee agreements. Uh, I'd like for both of you to talk about what is a, a good, effective fee agreement? Uh, what are, what's the purpose of them? What, are, what is a lawyer? What are the objectives uh, to a fee agreement? And uh, how, can that, uh, how can a good one really help um, avoid problems down the road? Um, so I can certainly jump in, uh, you know, 20 colon 1.5 is uh, that portion of the Supreme Court rules that, that talks about fees in general uh, and, and tells lawyers when uh, fee agreements need to be in writing um, and when they can be something different. Uh, generally, I think it's always a good idea, no matter what the dollar amount involved is or what the, the nature of the representation is, uh, that those things be clarified uh, in, in writing. Um, they don't always need to be signed by the client. Um, but it, it just makes sense, even if it is, you know, a minor matter uh, to make that communication both under, you know, applicable to rule 1.4 um, regarding communication, um, but also with respect to just understanding what the arrangement is in the first place so that lawyer and client alike can feel good about the relationship and, and where it's going. Um, so, you know, some of the rules I'll just sort of uh, gloss over, um, such as, you know, I think everybody knows a lawyer shall not uh, make an agreement or charge an unreasonable amount um, for the work that they're doing. Um, the time and labor uh, required is definitely a consideration when we're considering what a reasonable fee is, uh, the novelty, and that's not necessarily to the lawyer. Um, you know, we can, we can and we have uh, spent entire days talking about, you know, what we understand to be dabbling, uh, which is where a lawyer may not necessarily have uh, the competence in any particular area, but they want to. Um, immigration, for example, um, is, is uh, an area of law that has exploded um, in need. And so that can be attractive to uh, attorneys who are looking to grow their practice into a different area or um, are looking to um, you know, just try something new. Um, you know, be careful uh, only because, um, you know, the client shouldn't necessarily have to pay for the attorney to learn everything there is to know about immigration to handle their small matter. Um, I think that's where, uh, when we're talking about the context of fees, you know, that's where that impacts, you know, is this a novel area of the law or is this a novel area by way of practice to the attorney? Um, and then, you know, 
is, is the fee that you charge as a lawyer, is that customarily charged in the locality for similar legal services? I think in, uh, in the different areas of Wisconsin, expectations uh, of, of fees are different, um, both because lawyers practicing in, in certain counties uh, charge less and clients who are paying for professional services from a lawyer uh, don't expect to pay as much uh, in, in one county versus another. Um, so are you consistent with what is being charged in, in locality? Um, and then uh, the amount involved and the results obtained. Now, I don't like to talk about results obtained because I don't think any agreement, any fee agreement should include, um, you know, a, a guarantee of success. Um, there is no such thing as a slam dunk and that ought to be communicated to the client. Um, but I think what that part of the rule gets to is was there an easier, less time-consuming way to achieve the same result? Uh, and if you know that, you know, I think as lawyers, we do have the ability to adjust our fees. And so if you uh, accomplish the task at hand, um, but realize at the end of it that it probably could have been done differently to save your client money, tell them or tell her uh, and then adjust your fee accordingly. I think that's appropriate. Um, and then uh, the nature and length of the professional relationship I think clients feel that when they call asking questions of the lawyer, that they shouldn't be billed for that for some reason. And so there are, uh, there are clients who are more demanding than others um, and who are more insistent than others. That takes your time and, and your time, as we all know, is your skill and trade and that ought to be billed. Um, and if it's clear um, you know, from your billing statements that the client has contacted you 20 times you know, in a week, um, you know, that goes to the reasonableness of a higher fee. I think it's more reasonable under those circumstances than it would be otherwise. Um, and then experience, reputation, and ability uh, of, of lawyers. I think what, what lawyers need to understand is that they get better. Um, and so, it, you know, as time goes by, you know, not just adjusting for the, you know, the, uh, the current cost of dollars, um, but also adjusting for, you know, your gained expertise, you can you know, resolve things a little more efficiently. Uh, you have more relationships as Mark and uh, Kathleen described this morning that uh, help you help your client. Uh, those are all things that, you know, sort of go into the reasonableness of the fee or the reasonableness of your hourly rate. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, whether the fee is, is fixed or contingent. I think there's a, there's a recognized risk in taking a matter on on a contingency basis where, um, you know, it's, it's something that is, uh, you know, perhaps you've only, you know, you've settled the case early on and you didn't necessarily put a whole lot of work into it, uh, but there was also a risk that you weren't going to get anything. Um, so uh, although a contingency fee may seem high uh, to a client, uh, I think that piece of, of uh, the consideration of the reasonableness of a fee uh, definitely makes sense. Um, so, uh, you know, as far as uh, fee agreements go, uh, Tom, you asked, you know, what goes into a good fee agreement? Um, in, in situations where you regularly represent the client uh, on the same basis, um, it doesn't necessarily always have to be communicated to the client in writing. In other words, you're sort of doing the same thing over and over for a client. Um, and, and it just maybe involves different uh, different specifics um, that, that don't necessarily need to be communicated in writing because everybody already understands the terms. Uh, I think that's just a practical consideration that was included in the rules. Um, but um, if the total cost of the representation is going to be more than $1,000, uh, it, it shall be communicated in writing. Um, so I think, I think you do have to do that. It doesn't necessarily need to be signed by the client, uh, but it does need to be communicated in writing uh, shortly after or uh, contemporaneous with the commencement of the representation. Um, and then um, I, I guess the only other one that I would mention is the contingency fee agreement, which I started to talk about. Um, but that is something that does need to be communicated to the client and does need to be in writing. Uh, and then obviously, if you're in a family law matter or if you're in a criminal law matter, uh, you're not allowed to uh, enter into a contingency fee agreement. Um, so um, the last thing that I'll say uh, before I turn it back to Stacy for her thoughts on this is, you know, 
with respect to to fee division, take a look at the the latter part of the of one point five, um, which which talks about uh, dividing fees between lawyers. Um, you know, it, the fee still has to be reasonable. Um, so yes, we're paying more lawyers now, um, but uh, the the fee still has to be one that's reasonable. Um, and then, I guess the last cautionary note is is be careful who you refer cases to, because uh, if you take a look at, um, I believe it's sub E. Yeah, sub E has to do with payment that I just talked about. Uh, but then sub three, sub E sub three of 1.5, uh, pursuant to the referral of a matter between the lawyers, each lawyer assumes the same ethical responsibility for the representation as if the lawyers were partners in the same firm. Um, and so you really are tied to that lawyer, um, not just by way of, of uh, you know, reasonableness of, of fees, but also in meeting the ethical obligations that you may have that have an impact on the representation. Uh, and so um, as long as you know who it is that you're referring the case to, uh, you know, you, you need to make sure that those things are being met. Stacy, what are your thoughts on uh, Stacy, before you jump in, I, I was thinking too, I, I had jotted down in my notes uh, stuff we hear about from time to time. And as I was looking through your outline um, recently, I, I was thinking about things like, um, you know, the extent of the representation. In other words, um, are you promising to represent the client in all legal proceedings or, or is this a, a limited scope? uh, representation and you, you know, you're, you're carving out certain, certain things. Um, and then the other one was, um, you know, putting a fee into a fee agreement, um, working together. In other words, um, is the, is the client going to share in the decision-making process? And if so, how, and, uh, I, I know those are all areas that can get kind of squishy, uh, particularly when the client gets a little, um, uh, anxious, uh, about their case. Maybe you can comment on some of that too. Um, all right. Uh, yeah. The um, limited scope uh, was actually something I put in my notes as Matt was talking. So this is serendipitous. Um, I'm finding more and more that um, people are, and this may be j jumping off from dabbling, or this may just be jumping off, jumping off from, um, from budgeting. Um, that more and more I get uh, calls from both clients who want to retain me to help with um, perhaps a healthcare licensing issue or from lawyers who've had this issue with their own clients um, that they want to, they want to be represented, but they don't want to pay for what a hearing or some other large scope thing would cost. Um, they think this is something that may resolve through negotiation but the possibility of a hearing is already there. And perhaps the uh, going to a hearing may cost several times more than just negotiation and, uh, and settlement would. Um, so in those cases, I've see both uh, seen and recommended um, perhaps doing a limited scope um, uh, fee agreement that states uh, this fee agreement is good for the negotiation, fact finding, negotiation and um, dra settlement drafting phase only. It will cost you X either as a flat fee or as a um, on an hourly rate. If we um, do not settle and this matter goes to a hearing and you would like me to represent you, then it will cost Y or I will require a deposit in my trust account of amount Y. Um, and putting it out there in writing at the beginning um, like that, I think, you know, comports with both uh, uh, 21.5 uh, as well as 21.2, which talks about um, limited scope agreements. And it goes back to managing those clients' expectations about what they might be able to expect for the monies that they have paid. Um, because unfortunately, sometimes we run into a situation where you say, oh, I think this will settle. Give me $2,500 in my trust account. I think it'll, and I'll, I'll charge $250 an hour um, for easy math here. It's not going to take, it won't take more than 10 hours to get this done. And then something happens. There is a surprise fact you didn't know about um, at the beginning of representation or uh, the client changes their mind or the opposing party is more, um, resistant to settlement than you had anticipated, even based on past uh, performance. And all of a sudden you're in a hearing posture and it's gonna cost another $10,000 to even get to that point. And the client's, what? I, don't, I can't do this. And you're setting the client up to fail. You're setting yourself up to fail. So making it very, very 
clearly communicated um, as to what might count for what, what, um, how much it would cost to go through various phases of litigation and or the the proceeding, and what should be um, what you're willing to do in in those stages. I think is important. Um, also, in in that, uh, I it's it's important to remember that if you do take a an advanced fee that you don't place in trust, either as a flat fee or um, as uh, however you do it. Uh, you do need to include in your fee agreement those alternative, um, the alternative protection language um, found in uh, 21.5 sub G, uh, which refers to uh, the amount of the, um, of the payment, the basis for that fee, any expenses that the client will be responsible for, and the lawyer, specifically the lawyer's obligation to refund any unearned portion of the, that advanced fee. Uh, and to submit the dispute to fee arbitration if uh, if there is a dispute and it's not resolved 30 days after being notified of the result of the um, of the dispute. So that's that's a requisite in the Supreme Court rules. Um, normally, when if you're doing a standard um, hourly rate where you're putting advanced uh, payments into trust, uh, you don't need those disclosures. I and I strongly recommend putting a fee agreement and making it as plain English as possible rather than as um, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a tough balance. And I get that because we're lawyers, we want to be precise. We have language from the Supreme Court rules and from the fee agreements we've been using for a long time. Um, but sometimes that's not understandable by our clients. And it's important that whatever we communicate with our clients, be it in a fee agreement, or in an email or in a letter or on the phone, that they be able to understand it. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to, um, you know, we have to take an affirmative step to translate it into a language that we're not a, into their first language unless they, you know, indicate I need a translator or I need an interpretation. And then that becomes a subject uh, of, of how that works as well. Um, but it does mean that we shouldn't be using words designed to, um, you know, uh, designed to get lawyers excited, but that are not understandable to people without law training. Um, so th those, those are all important. Um, also, just uh, something to, to jump off on the idea that this fee agreement needs to be in writing. Um, I think most uh, most lawyers understand this, but not all do. Um, writing doesn't have to be pen and paper mailed letter. It can be email. Often it is email these days. It can even be the body of an email uh, as opposed to an attachment. And um, for most fee agreements that don't have to be signed, just emailing somebody in perhaps getting a re receipt requested, or you know that that's a good email address and you know that they're gonna get it, that may be sufficient. Um, receiving a confirmation via email that they got it and agree to the terms, that also may be sufficient. Now that said, a lot of lawyers feel more comfortable at least emailing a PDF and getting a, an, or, or a, going through DocuSign as was mentioned in the earlier panel, um, so you have something that looks sort of like a cursive signature on a piece of paper that you can pull out of your file electronically or paper-wise and produce it if you need to, but that's not necessarily required. There's very, very few instances um, that require wet signatures on physical pieces of paper, and a fee agreement is not one of them. Um, a stipulation with the Office of Lawyer Regulation, unfortunately, is, which um, makes a uh, makes uh, my job a little more difficult, especially these days with the mail as slow as it can be and people not working um, at their offices anymore. But um, fee agreements can be sent via email. Stacy, have you seen during the pandemic, uh, you know, lawyers who are not, who have not been meeting with clients in person, and particularly, you know, initial meetings? And how do you how, how do you really um, get those um, get everything in place for a client so that they understand what's happening. And, and for you as an attorney to really get a feel for what the client expects to happen um, when you're not meeting them in person, are you, do you, are you, have you been seeing that? And are lawyers more and more now going back to in-person meetings or what's, what's happening out there? Well, I'm one of them who hasn't been meeting with clients in person since March. Um, and most of the time, the clients prefer it that way as well. I work statewide. And often, um, even before the pandemic, most of my initial meetings were done via phone. Um, now, more and more, they're being done via Zoom or Skype or, or FaceTime, another way to, to, um, to, to be able to look at people and, and assess their credibility and, and at least match a name to a face. But um, I think, you know, I, 
not everybody's going back to working in an office. Um, and those who are aren't necessarily there every day and clients don't necessarily want to come out in person. So, um, you know, there are some challenges. Uh, documents are harder to, when, they, when you're not meeting in person and going through the documents and you need documents, what happens is either the, the client will mail you or drop off a giant banker's box and then you need to sort it and figure out what's what and, and or they'll email it to you and you got to download, you know, lots of gigabytes of, of data and, and sort through that. And whereas um, if you would normally meet with people in person, sometimes you can go through that banker's box with them and determine on the spot a little more what's what and what's relevant because often clients will, especially individual clients rather than sophisticated corporate parties, will just bring in that box of, of documents and um, they will either have a perceived relevance problem or a perceived irrelevance problem. They're not, they don't know what's relevant and what's not. And so um, they'll either bring in everything under the sun that may have something tangentially to do with their matter, or they won't bring in things that you actually need. And that's something easier to determine, I think, with um, the physical documents in front of you than it is to determine in a big electronic dump. Um, but um, I am- So what, should, seeing, what, what are things lawyers can do to uh, overcome some of these challenges when you're not meeting in person? Well, I do think video conferencing helps um, because it does um, allow you to have more of a conversation in real time where you can see each other, assess our facial expressions, tone, things like that, that are harder to measure via regular telephone calls. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I'm not going to advise, give people a blanket advice at this point to know it's important that you meet in person every client. I've, I've never had that. I've never done that. Um, even mm -hmm. pre pandemic, again, I work statewide and sometimes I have out of state clients and I will never meet some of these people in person. Um, and that's fine. Um, but I, yeah, I do think, um, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to say exactly what will mitigate this because it's going to be very case by case. Um, give yourself plenty of time. Um, this is, I think, one instance in which if you've got a 30 day discovery deadline, don't sit on it and get extensions when you need them, give extensions when the other side needs them. I mean, we're Wisconsin nice here, folks. We don't have to, uh, to fight every battle. And I think, um, especially during this pandemic, but generally if somebody asks for a couple extra weeks on discovery or if somebody asks, um, for a mutual extension of witness lists, and it's not going to harm the case going forward because there's other deadlines that still need to be met. Or um, just give the give the extension. It's the right you know. It, it's almost always going to be the right thing to do, and you never know when you're going to need one and have to you know. If if you were if you were mean to opposing counsel for no reason about an extension they needed, they'll have no reason to be nice to you later. So that's um, I think I think because you know, time has sort of melted over the last nine or 10 months, that's um, be realistic about how long things are gonna take and give yourself some more time and make sure that you do, um, you know, as, as uh, Kathleen indicated in the last um, panel, discovery does suck and document review does suck. And um, that's, that's a task that I think many people, especially those who can't uh, delegate it to somebody junior to them and make them do it, they will put off um, because there are more pressing or more enjoyable tasks to do, or there's laundry that needs to be done or the dog that needs to be walked uh, these days. And so, um, but, but I think right now waiting to go through that virtual, virtual banker's box of documents is, um, is not a great idea because of um, it's, you need more time for follow-up. You need, chances are you're gonna have to ask people questions about what is this document? I'm not really sure what its relevance is, but perhaps you know, there's, there's, it's not obvious from his face, but perhaps it really is. So let's talk. Whereas again, you might've done that in person um, earlier or with paper documents, which some people find easier, but you're not going to necessarily print out 10,000 pages um, that were emailed to your house or that you were emailed to your work computer or sent through share file, but through your home printer, you're not going to be printing out 10,000 pages to go through them on your, on your dining room table. Right. Um, at, you know, I, we're talking about engagement letters, fee agreements. Um, and in, in the outline, I, as I was looking through that earlier, um, Matt, you know, that it says a good engagement letter starts with the lawyer's initial conversation with a potential client. And so if the initial converse, uh, conversation is not in person, um, you know, and you're trying to ascertain what is the client's level of understanding, um, 
you know, you're trying to pick up body language in terms of their expectations for this whole thing. And um, I, I'm, I'm sure those come with, with, a, with their own set of, of challenges that can, if not met, uh, can lead to a, a, either a malpractice claim or, a, or a, uh, certainly a, a potential, potential claim. Yeah, they sure could. Um, you know, and I, I, underneath that, that part of the, it's on page four of the materials, um, you know, we, we've talked about quite a few of these things, so I, I won't hit on each and every one of them, um, but it really sort of is that exercise in uh, relationship building um, on a, in a virtual way, which is, which is, I think everybody acknowledges and understands is a little bit odd. Um, but, you know, I, I think if, if, if lawyers can do a few things and, and Tom, you and I have had quite a few presentations via Zoom um, to local bar associations in, in recent months, for sure. Um, and we've asked uh, just about, we've asked this question in just about every one of them. And so we get little tips along the way. And I've included some of those on, on pages four and five. Um, and, I, you know, I can tell you from my own, you know, my perspective as a a client, um, we've reached out uh, to various defense counsel uh, at the very early stages of the pandemic and, um, you know, just to understand where everybody was uh, because we didn't know if they're going to be in their office. We didn't know if they were going to be in their home. We didn't know if means and methods of communication were going to change. Um, and almost every one of our defense counsel, uh, you know, was very proactive in putting those things together and communicating them to all of their clients. Um, so I, I think that's an important step. If anything has changed and, and you know, technology is great and, and a lot of the moves were seamless. I'm still working with my office phone, my physical office phone from my office, you know, on my table here. And it has the same number. It all works the same way. And, and you know, technology made all of those things possible. But for a time, uh, it wasn't. And so I was communicating using, you know, whatever forms of communication I had, including my own personal cell phone. And that's, uh, that's how people knew how to get a hold of me. Um, and so, you know, we did our best, you know, to proactively communicate that to uh, everybody who needed it. And I think that's an important lesson. Uh, so reach out proactively, get, get in front of your clients uh, in a different way to let them know exactly where you are. Um, and then keep up with those alternative forms of communication. I don't think email is an alternative form of communication anymore. I think it has become so common and so accepted, like Stacy noted, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, sort of takes the place of, you know, what used to be a letter uh, form of communication. Um, but now that we have it and it is more instantaneous, we've got to keep up with it uh, in ways that, that both lawyer and client feel comfortable keeping up with it. In other words, if somebody emails you at 1130 at night and Mark Young gets that email on his phone, he gets that buzz. I don't think Mark Young expects himself to, you know, respond right then. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, the, the, the response, you know, if any, um, you know, can be a got your email, let me give some thought to it and give you a more thoughtful response later um, is perfectly acceptable. Um, so keep up with your emails, but do it in a way that meet both your expectations and the client's expectations. Um, and and then, can, I, uh, can I cut in on that? Because I think that's an important point, especially with this pandemic. Um, yeah. I've been working all sorts of weird hours. Um, some of my clients uh, um, uh, know this and some don't. And I, that's, that's something that I, I try to manage uh, again. Um, the, at the beginning of this, I became nearly nocturnal for reasons. Um, it's moderated a little bit since then, but I'm still more likely to be, I'm more likely to be working efficiently at 11 o'clock at night than 11 o'clock in the morning. It just, it is what it is. Um, but I'm careful about who I email or, um, you know, who I send things to at a late hour because, you know, if, frankly, if it's somebody else working weird hours like me, that's fine, but I don't want to create this expectation that I am available 24 um, seven. So if I finish something like a draft to a client and it's not absolutely uh, time sensitive that I, you know, I, I promise them I will send it to you tonight before I go to bed, in which case sometimes they do get it at weird hours and we just have to deal. But if it's something that I was planning on sending them on Wednesday and it is Tuesday at 11 p.m. and I have finished, I will save it, set it aside and send it at 9 a.m. on Wednesday morning again to manage that expectation that I am um, I, because it's not, I, again, I don't, I'm, I'm broadcasting to the 200 people in this audience that I work weird hours and sleep weird hours. It's not a secret. 
Um, but at the same time, I don't want that to become the norm or become the expectation that people can email me at one o'clock in the morning and expect a response. Yeah, no, I, I teach them how to communicate with you, right? According to, to your rules and, and, and make sure everybody understands them. Um, yeah, important point. Um, another one there is, is stay connected when you're working from home. And, and it is difficult at times, um, you know, whether your, uh, your, uh, your, your child student is writing a, a report on the Ho-Chunk Nation or um, whether your, your spouse is, is a music teacher and is teaching music lessons, um, you know, in the next room. Um, try to set yourself up. You know, I, I think everybody, uh, you know, has a, a baseline level of understanding that it is different and, and things are going to be uh, distracting. Um, but, uh, you know, if you can, you know, and to the extent that you can try to set up your workspace in, in, in a place where you can always use it as, as such. In other words, uh, we have laptops, we have phones, we have uh, all kinds of, of uh, tools that are very mobile, which can be very useful at times, but I think you still need a base camp. Um, and preferably for lawyers, because I, one of the rules that we don't necessarily go into in the materials is confidentiality. Um, but if, it, if you have a place where you can close a door, you know, that may become important from time to time as you go throughout your practice. Uh, so Matt, stay I, had a, I, I had a lawyer, I had a lawyer tell me, uh, I think it was last month, uh, she was on a, uh, a virtual uh, uh, court proceeding and her husband and son decided they were going to play video games in the background. And uh, <laughs> that didn't work out so well for, for either side. <laughs> yeah. I, I was having a, a conversation with an attorney and it, it's the spousal uh, music teacher uh, setting. And uh, while she was talking, the star spangled banner on the trumpet started playing in the background. But so I think, yeah. I think we've all got those stories and, and maybe some that are worse. Um, but right. Right. You know, I, I think uh, setting yourself up to be able to succeed in, in, in a setting to the extent you can is, is a good step to take. Yep. Um, you know, if, if you don't mind, we, we talked about a couple of things. One, we talked about, um, well, we started to talk about uh, communication in general and the, the rule that governs lawyers behavior there is 1.4, 20 colon 1.4. Uh, and then we also talked about limited scope agreements. Um, and that kind of takes you all over the outline. Um, but one of the concepts uh, for both or that, that exists in both rules is informed consent. And I just want to make sure that everybody understands um, that concept. Um, because informed consent uh, is in SCR 20 colon 1.0 sub F is in Frank. And it's, I didn't, well, I, I did put the citation, but um, I just want to go over that rule a little bit. Um, uh, but it's defined as the agreement by a person to a proposed course of conduct after the lawyer has communicated adequate information and explanation about the material risks of and reasonably available alternatives to the proposed course of conduct. That the whole, whenever informed consent is required, um, you know, I think a, a lawyer's spidey sense and, and the tingling feeling, you know, ought to go off so that you, you pay a little closer attention and you address it, you know, the way that it deserves to be addressed. And Tim Pierce has written quite a few articles about informed consent, what it is, how it's met. Um, and, and including trying to tackle a lot of those gray terms that, you know, I, I mentioned in there, you know, the adequate information about material risks and reasonable alternatives. Um, but really what, what informed consent is, it, it's inviting the utmost communication between lawyer and client um, so that there is a clear understanding about what the client is about to undertake um, and they have to agree. And so how do you get them to agree? Um, you know, it's not necessarily like Stacy mentioned, you know, it's not something that requires a wedding signature all the time. Um, but, you know, I have, I have three suggestions to meet your obligations under both informed consent and just generally the rules of, uh, or the rule uh, uh, regarding communication in 20 colon 1.4. The first is an IAY letter. I advised you. Uh, when you have conversations with a client um, and uh, it involves you giving your advice as, uh, as a professional, I think you need to follow that up in writing so that it's clear uh, and we don't end up, uh, you know, in a grievance setting or a claim setting and we're guessing about what was said because the client said or says and understood one thing and the lawyer says and understood something completely different. 
with an IAY letter, you know, you sort of remove all of those questions that get asked down the road. Who cares what he said? Who cares what she said? You know, we've got this, this writing, you know, that we have to refer to that clearly communicates this, clearly communicates that, or is, you know, clearly absent of this. Um, that, that is extremely helpful um, from, uh, well, from, from our um, consideration as, as claims attorneys uh, to find that sort of documentation in a file. Um, similarly, uh, I refer them as refer to them as uh, Comey memos, um, where you know you have a contemporaneous record, you know, um, writing of of what exactly the conversation was, what you know, when it happened, what was said, uh, and, and any other information that that might be pertinent. Um, obviously, that's a reference to um, you know a political time uh, that I don't want to get into, but. Um, it, it's something that, you know, obviously resonated with those of us who write those kinds of memos. They're valuable um, and they make sense. Um, and then the last one is be involved in your billing descriptions. I think if there's one thing that clients will read um, because they know that at the end of reading it, you know, they're usually going to have to write a check or, or pay a significant amount of money are your billings. Um, and so, you know, conversation with you is not as valuable or not as informative as conversation with you about the subject real estate uh, and the ramifications of entering into a land contract with client X or, or person X. You know, be more descriptive. And, and uh, you know, one, it helps, you know, as just sort of a, that sort of contemporaneous journal of what's happening in the file. Um, but it also answers a lot of questions that clients may, might have. Well, what did I talk to them about on, you know, December 1st? You know, I don't remember that conversation. Um, and so if there's more to it, um, you know, put it in there. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, the long drawn out memo with, you know, issues presented, questions answered and advice given, you know, but it, it should have at least uh, more in it so that the client has a good understanding about uh, what exactly happened. Um, so I think, uh, well, and then with respect to limited scope representation. Hey, Matt, uh, before, you jump, before you jump to that, we have a question from a viewer, uh, and, and uh, Stacy and, and Matt, if both of you want to address this. Uh, the question is, is it ethical to charge for an IAY letter? Absolutely. <laughs> I, you know, I think that's part of, you know, the delivery of a professional service um, and, and clarifying any questions. I, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, the conversation is one thing and the drafting of the letter shouldn't, you know, I mean, you know, in, in my opinion and the, the, the type of letter that I'm describing, you know, it, it was, it was, uh, it would be an issue, you know, that would warrant a letter follow up to make sure there is a clear understanding of what exactly what exact advice was given. And I think that's exactly what lawyers are good at doing. Uh, and that's why they get hired uh, to help solve problems and then communicate how best to do that to the client. What do you think, Stacey? I agree. Um, so you had this conversation with the, the client, you've um, told them things, you're memorialized in that conversation for them. And it is for them, not just for you. Um, it helps the client be aware of what was discussed. It gives them an opportunity to ask follow-up questions if they need to, like, this wasn't quite how I understood our conversation. Are you sure? Um, and so it benefits both parties. This isn't just something you're doing for your own, completely your own benefit. This is, this is for them. So I agree. And on the timing of emails, uh, Mark Young has, has chimed in here. Mark says, uh, I will not hesitate to send an email on a weekday evening or on the weekend, but I put limits on the client expectation. My thought is that if I am working at 7 p.m., I might as well get some enhanced client loyalty by letting them know I am working on their matter. Uh, and then he adds, uh, not being a football fan, though, I have learned to be cautious on Sunday afternoons when there might be a big NFL game, especially a Packer game. So, uh, yeah, keep, oh. keep in mind uh, <laughs> when, when you're interrupting clients, I suppose. Absolutely. But, and I think, I think, I think that's fair. I mean, this is not a, this isn't a, when to send that email um, is more of a business decision than an ethical one. It's um, mm -hmm. and there are some clients that I will uh, email at 7 PM or at 11 PM or at 3 AM. Um, um, I won't do 3 AM for a client loyalty purpose, but I might do it if it's a fellow nocturnal traveler. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that uh, I, it, it, it's a strategic decision. I make case by case. Gotcha. Um, 
Matt, we're, uh, I, I know in your outline, uh, suing for fees is an issue. Uh, you want to talk about the, uh, and, and Stacy, I know you'll have some ideas on this because uh, I know that uh, OLR complaints often uh, are focused on, on fees, but uh, suing for fees, the, uh, the, the pros and cons, there are, there are risks to it, are there not, Matt? Uh, you bet. And I'm going to, before I, I'll, I'll answer, I'll answer that for sure. But, uh, Oh, you want to do limited page. scope. I'm sorry. I did just real briefly. And that yeah, yeah. was just, just so, to point okay. out that, um, even, even limiting scope, you know, doesn't just be careful. And I have the, you know, the, the site to Tim Pierce's article, uh, and the case in there from California that he relies on Nichols v. Keller on page six of the materials. And, uh, he offers the example of, of the workers' compensation lawyer who takes on the workers' compensation case, uh, but doesn't want to go into the third-party liability personal injury action, doesn't want to investigate that for whatever reason. Certainly, you can limit that scope. Um, you, know, you have to you know, get informed consent from your client, um, but that doesn't necessarily relieve you of all of your obligations. In other words, if there's uh, something that comes up in the context of representing the client in the workers' compensation claim, uh, that would have impact on a personal injury ma matter that's related to the same set of events, you know, it's still up to the lawyer to communicate that um, to the client. It, that's how I read that case. And that's how I read Tim Pierce's article. Uh, so just be aware of your ethical obligations, even if you do limit your scope uh, of representation. Um, suing for fees, um, terrible statistics out there. Um, you know, the, the ABA, you know, estimates that 7% of legal malpractice claims arose in connection with an attempt to collect fees. I think anecdotally, if you talk to defense counsel or if you talk to uh, Wilmec or any other malpractice carrier, you'll, you'll find estimates are much higher than that. Um, and, and in fact, uh, some carriers, not Wilmec, uh, but some carriers, as soon as they get wind of an attorney suing for fees, um, they will either drastically increase rates or drop them altogether. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's, um, that's, that's important to consider. Um, so before you sue for fees, when I, when, I get the, when I get the call from an insured attorney and they ask me that question, I, I get, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm very supportive. Um, and, I, and I think that lawyers ought to be paid for the work that they do. And I get upset when they don't get paid um, because I, I know that you're all working very hard and I know that you're, you know, you're doing something that's difficult. Um, you know, what we do is hard. Um, and, you know, it, it's really something that, you know, isn't uh, easily recognized as valuable by many. Um, and so uh, I don't necessarily encourage people to sue for fees, but uh, I, I do think that, uh, no is not the, the right answer to that. And um, a more thoughtful response is what I've included in, in the outline. And that is to ask yourself, you know, these questions. Uh, was the client pleased with the outcome? Yes or no? Did they expect the outcome? You know, we had that conversation earlier um, about, you know, what are the client's expectations? Do they think they have a slam dunk? And have you sort of steered them down a, a correct path of reasonable expectations? Um, are you critical of your own performance? Could you have done something better? Um, and would suing for fees just sort of invite a microscope into the things that you did wrong? Um, uh, has an uninvolved attorney assessed? Um, you know, Kathleen and, and Mark talked quite a bit about having a good network of professional uh, acquaintances and friends, um, you know, that would help them enhance their practice and, and be better lawyers. Um, do you have someone like that that you could ask to take a look, you know, hey, this, this person didn't pay me. I think I did a good job. What do you think? Um, is, is the amount at stake worth the risk? Um, you know, if we're talking about, you know, $1,000, you know, and, and the risk of, of facing a malpractice claim or even a grievance um, will end up outspending the value of that bill uh, pretty quickly. Um, so pay attention to the economics. Don't get so involved in it emotionally so that, that you, you, uh, you make a, a poor decision economically. Um, is there an alternative to a lawsuit? Um, do you still have an open line of communication with, you know, that client or former client probably, um, where you can try to leverage a, a different solution? Um, you know, a payment plan is, is, is pretty common, I think. And that's something that I think would be reasonable under the circumstances. Uh, explore that with the client, see if that they're willing to do that. And then uh, I already talked about how you know, different malpractice carriers, including Wilmick, might handle or might respond to that kind of a claim. Um, but then also ask yourself is, you know, is that judgment collectible? 
Uh, I did a fair amount of collections work um, early in my career. And, uh, you know, oftentimes we talked about that judgment that you can frame and put on your wall. Um, you know, if it's not collectible, you know, it may not actually be worth pursuing. You never know where, um, if it is reduced to a judgment, where that judgment debtor will be in a year from now, two years, three years from now. Uh, judgments have a pretty long life. Um, but, you know, if it's something that is probably not collectible now and probably isn't going to be, um, that should weigh in on your decision about whether or not to sue for fees. So I think overall, you know, it's not something that is immediately um, disclosed or uh, excluded by, by, by Wilmick um, or prohibited otherwise, um, you know, but it is something that, that ought to, that deserves a little bit of thought before actually pursuing. Matt, we have a, uh, and Stacy too, we have a question from the audience. Uh, viewer writes, is fee arbitration at the bar a protection against the risk of suit for fees or does it present the same issues and risks? Good question. What do you, yeah. Um, well, um, in, in my experience, the fee arbitrations that I've consulted on or represented uh, lawyers on tend to be initiated by the client, not by the attorney, or they're initiated as a result of a diversion agreement. Um, uh, one, one potential outcome of a disciplinary matter is a, a non-disciplinary diversion agreement um, in which the a, a lawyer agrees to do something or refrain from doing something for a certain period or uh, and, and often uh, when these are when these are grievances that are basically fee disputes wrapped up in something else, um, a diversion may include may, it may they, it may not even involve a finding of any sort of um, uh, wrongdoing. It may just be a way to avoid this going any further. And they say, all right, you got to submit this to fee arbitration, and if the client is willing to participate, you got to go through it and cooperate. Um, so that's where I see fee arbitrations. Um, I haven't seen a ton where the attorney. Um, initiates it as a collection mechanism. Yeah. Um, so it's hard, it's hard for me to actually assess uh, risk of doing so because I haven't seen a ton of it. I would imagine that it could dredge up some of the same issues because you still have that upset person on the other side of this. They're not paying your fees for one of two reasons, either they can't or they won't. And sometimes it's both, but um, you've, you've just charged them way more than they can afford, in which case they may not be upset with you they might just be upset with the situation or they're refusing to, in which case chances are they are upset with you in some fashion, even if it's due to things coming out more expensive than they expected, um, in which case it would dredge up those issues and may require uh, and may trigger them to like, fine, all right, if you're going to actually demand the fees for the services that you rendered that I don't want to pay, I'm going um, to counter. So, I would think the fee, the issues and risks are probably the same are they not not it's not necessarily the fee arbitration program is not necessarily protection against any of those risks would i be right to say that right i mean that's uh, the fee arbitration program it's i would imagine from the client's perspective at least if you initiate a fee arbitration or if you sue them in small claims or large claims court it's probably the same thing on their end you're you're they're being attacked for or, or gone after for the fees but also the program itself um even if you do initiate an arbitration and whether you win or lose, you're right, that doesn't um, change their ability to file a malpractice claim against you or to file a grievance. In fact, um, if you were to um, settle ahead of a fee arbitration, uh, you cannot in your settlement include a provision that prevents them from being able to file a grievance against you. That's an absolute prohibition. You, they can't agree to it, you can't agree to it. Uh, the arbitrator cannot require that. Uh, uh, with, in terms of malpractice, um, in a fee arbitration, perhaps the, the risk might be a little higher because as far as I know, fee arbitration is just for fees. You can't counter them if, uh, you know, if, if you sue somebody for fees in court, they can counterclaim for malpractice and they often do. And then all those issues can at least be resolved in the same proceeding and be done. Um, in fee arbitration, if you go after them for fees, that doesn't stop them from separately filing a malpractice claim. So it could actually add up there. Yeah, it could definitely give you two different forums to fight what is seemingly the same battle. Um, Stacy, do you have any uh, feeling for how successful or unsuccessful the fee arbitration program is? And I'm talking, you know, most of our audience are lawyers, um, you know, from their perspective, I guess, then, you know, is it, is it successful? 
Um, well, again, I haven't seen many that involve a fee collection. I've seen them more from the wanting a refund or wanting a reduction in their fees for, mm -hmm. from the client side. And in those cases, um, the arbitrators or arbitrators are called upon to determine whether the fee charged was reasonable, and if not, what would be a reasonable fee, more or less. And unfortunately, I'm seeing a ton of just, or and a ton is relative. It's not that I've done a ton or seen a ton of these, but a large percentage of the ones that I'm familiar with involve a split the baby situation. If there's ten thousand dollars in fees that are claimed by the um, by the attorney and the client says, I shouldn't have to pay anything because I did a lousy job. Uh, the arbitrator says, all right, $5,000 and call it a day. Um, so in terms of whether that's successful or not, I suppose it's in the eye of the beholder. If it was, um, if this was $5,000 that the um, attorney was never going to get if they left to their own devices and now they have the opportunity to get $5,000, that's probably a success. But if they were um, expecting their full fee, and the arbitrator, they, they perceive that the arbitrator uh, uh, messed it up, then it's not a success. And I, and I guess I would just echo my earlier comment, which was, you know, be descriptive in your billings um, so that, you know, the, the time associated with that billing entry is, is uh, relatively easily justified. Um, so I hope we answered the, the question. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. Um, all right. We're, uh, we're, we got a little bit of time left. Uh, I thought at this point, um, Stacy, uh, on all our complaint has been filed. Now what? Uh, can you walk us through how a lawyer navigates that process? I know there's a lot to it. Um, <laughs> sure, I'll, can, uh, I'll give the ten thousand foot view. Um, the first thing, um, more and more, you're receiving information. You're receiving notice that a grievance has been filed against you through email. So check your email, make sure your spam filter is not set to an overly aggressive standard. And if it is, you check your spam filter regularly um, because that's more often than not how you're going to get word of um, the grievance. Now, the good news is, is that you're not getting a uh, word of the grievance via, te via telephone as much as you used to, which means you can take a step back because I know it's, uh, it's scary to get that email or that telephone call or, um, more often previously, that letter from Office of Lawyer Regulation stamped personal and confidential in big red letters. And, you know, I'll freely admit that um, I do this for a living and it is still scary to get correspondence from the OLR, even though most of it has nothing, it's client based and it's fine. Um, but it's still um, on, on the rare occasion I get a piece of paper in the mail. It's like, uh oh, what did I do? Um, now, when you do receive a grievance, the first thing to do is deep breaths. It is human nature to want to respond, vehemently deny everything, send every piece of paper in your office that has ever uh, had anything to do with that particular client or matter, um, but that's never going to be helpful. Um, you don't have to respond right away. Even if they call you on the telephone, you have no obligation to answer their questions right away. You can take that time to breathe. Um, you can take that time to put your carrier on notice because many carriers, including Wilmick, uh, provide grievance coverage. Um, which means that they will pay a certain amount to the defense attorney, often of your choice, um, to handle these things for you and help hopefully put a layer between you and the OLR. Because again, it's an emotional process. Even if you know you did nothing wrong, even if you have no idea who this person is, you still need to respond to it and it's your livelihood. So um, there is an emotional component to it. Um, uh, so uh, whether you do put your carry on notice or seek an attorney or decide to go it uh, alone, I would recommend not going it alone, alone, regardless. Um, talk to your, some, a colleague, talk to another lawyer outside of your firm, a friend, uh, your network that uh, Kathleen referred to in the last panel. Um, just bounce things off of them. Um, what you'll have to do initially is um, most lawyers are expected to respond to what's called an intake uh, investigation. Intake is informal, um, it's fact gathering. And um, sometimes it's just a blanket, you need to respond to um, the complaint that was filed. Here's a copy of the complaint or a summary of the complaint. And sometimes it's very specific questions and requests from documents for, from, the, uh, from the investigator. And you respond. And then um, at some point they might ask follow-up questions or they may go silent for weeks, months. Um, unfortunately, they're on their own timetable. Uh, there are some internal operating procedures that suggest timelines, but um, each case is unique. 
Uh, so one thing I do caution responding attorneys is that the amount of time that goes between communications from the OLR has absolutely nothing to do with the ultimate outcome. I've had cases that have remained open for a year and a half and then have been dismissed. So that's, it's not that they're digging deep and trying to, to get you. It's, it's just, it's, I, it's how it works. And um, I'm apparently one of the few uh, attorneys that defends grievances in the country that doesn't have any experience working for the prosecuting side for OLR or for its predecessor, the Board of Attorneys Professional Responsibility. Um, so I don't have that in as to their internal operating procedures. And frankly, even if I did, it wouldn't have been recent and things change. Um, the pandemic has slowed things down on their end as well as on ours. Um, but then at the end of intake, one of several things happens. Often the claim is dismissed. In fact, the, or, the overwhelming majority of grievances are dismissed at or shortly after intake and don't go any further. Um, after intake, uh, it can go- oh, why, why, why is that, Why is that, Stacey? Uh, just disgruntled well, clients who because, don't have a- don't have a- Yeah, a lot of them just, a lot of them, there's, there's nothing there. Um, they do have an, ob there, there is an obligation by OLR to investigate anything that comes in that they arguably have standing to investigate. So if they file, if somebody files a complaint against uh, somebody who's not, doesn't have any ties to Wisconsin or is deceased, then uh, the, the OLR will close that. Or if it's like, I want to, if they get a call, like I want to file a, a grievance to get divorced or something like that, they'll probably shoo that out um, because it's not within their jurisdiction. But if you make a complaint about a lawyer about anything that could potentially be a violation of the rules of professional conduct, they do have that duty to investigate at least somewhat. Um, but most of those don't get very far because um, uh, because they just it's either lack of uh, evidence of a violation or um, the conduct complained of is not. Uh, there's prosecutorial discretion; they can close it if it's not worth pursuing. If it's something very very de minimis, not worth it. Um, Although often that'll, that'll, that'll come with a caution or perhaps a referral to a, a diversion. But yeah, there's, it's just like the majority of, um, the majority of a lot of things don't go very far. And, and that's, that's where we are with this. Um, with, uh, however, if there is something more there, it may be referred to formal investigation. Again, um, this isn't necessarily a bad sign that things are going to go terribly for you or that it won't end up dismissed or in a diversion posture later. It's just the intake has um, completed and there's enough information to get to the next step. Now, formal investigation is where your duty to cooperate kicks in in full. Um, you need to fairly fully disclose the details, the facts and circumstances behind um, the, the, the events giving rise to the complaint. Um, the OLR again has been asked, they've been, their, their formal inquiry letters have been a lot more detailed recently. I don't know if that's again, an internal change or just um, something I've seen more of, but they're asking more 15, 20 questions for stacks of documents and so forth. And when you're responding to that again, be careful because um, anything that ends up in the OLR's hands becomes fair game. Even if they didn't initially ask for it, even if they, they were never going to ask for it, if you provide it and they have an issue with it, it becomes fair game for follow-up investigation. And I see that a lot with fee agreements um, where perhaps the lawyer comes to me after they submitted an initial round of documents and say, you know, I, I'm now in formal investigation and I have to, and I'm, 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 I need help now. And I see that they've submitted a lot of documentation. They've submitted their fee agreements that had nothing to do with the actual, what was requested in the intake. And the OLR says, "Hey, wait a second. This is a this is an advance fee that's not being that's being placed in your business account that doesn't include the required language from 1.5G. So we need to do something about that. And while yes, you should do something about your fee agreements, regardless of whether the OLR is on, on your back about it or not, um, that can give rise to discipline where it wouldn't have if you had not submitted it and it had when it wasn't asked for. That said, if it was asked for, you got to submit it regardless of whether it complies or not, and you just." If, if uh, I, I will often use that circumstance to counsel my clients on what the proper fee agreement looks like and submit a, a revised version saying my client is now, it has revised their um, agreement to conform with the, uh, with the rules, here it is. And that helps a lot. Now at the end of uh, investigation, again, the complaint can be dismissed. It can be offered a diversion, which again, the lawyer has to agree to. A uh, Stipulation for a reprimand, either public or private, can also be offered. Um, that doesn't need to go through a, a hearing or anything like that. That can that can be one way to resolve the case uh, after investigation, but without a hearing. 
um, or it can be um, referred to the preliminary review committee for a determination as to whether a formal complaint should be issued. And responding lawyers have chances at every step of the way to contribute information, respond, rebut um, allegations, uh, even suggest potential discipline if it gets to that point, if, they're, if the investigator is about to create a preliminary report that will be submitted to Director Celine and then perhaps later to the preliminary review committee. Um, at that point, you can uh, even suggest the level of discipline that might be appropriate if you do realize there is a violation here. Um, and again, I would advise people to tread carefully because um, telling the OLR, when you know that there are a few blatant violations, telling them it should be dismissed anyway, that's not going to get you very far. Um, but also, you know, I've had a few uh, clients who want to throw themselves on their sword for things that are relatively minor and routine, but they, they, it's, it, they feel bad about what happened and they feel they should be punished. And that's not the purpose of professional discipline. But um, if they had been self-represented, they might have said, I think you should suspend me um, when their conduct did not do anything to justify a suspension. I've, I've had a couple people in that situation. Most people don't volunteer to be suspended, but I've, I've seen it. Um, it's, I, I, I'm not sure what exactly um, uh, gives rise to that. But if, uh, if an agreement is not come to as to how to resolve the case, and um, then the matter can get forwarded to the preliminary review committee, for a determination as to whether a formal complaint can be issued. And then that formal complaint, if it is issued, it's filed with the Supreme Court. At that point, the case becomes public, a referee gets appointed and you go to a hearing. Um, you can still negotiate things and try to stipulate things if, if um, all of the facts are not in dispute and it's just the, the level of discipline that's in dispute, um, you can have a hearing on that. Or you can even stipulate as to, at this point, we think this is the appropriate level of discipline and then the referee makes the ultimate call. Um, and that may happen with or without a hearing. And then once the referee issues their decision, either based on a contested hearing, a set of stipulations or a combination of both, um, the uh, Supreme Court makes the ultimate decision. If either side doesn't like what the referee did or can't live with what the referee did, they have the opportunity to appeal the referee's recommendation. And if they do that, that leads to briefing and usually oral argument before the Supreme Court. If they don't appeal, then the Supreme Court makes a decision based on the record. Um, they don't have to follow the referee's recommendations. Uh, their findings of fact are given deference. Uh, conclusions of law and the level of discipline are not, although they, they look at the referee's recommendation and, and use that for guidance, but they, they're, they can look at it de novo as well. Um, and then ultimately the Supreme Court is the final arbiter or final, fi they, they make the final decision as to whether this case gets dismissed. Um, it ends in a reprimand, it ends in a suspension, it ends in revocation. And uh, finally, if um, the charges are very serious and the lawyer knows that they can't defend against them, and this usually involves criminal conduct, um, and there may even be a, a, a criminal case companion to it, um, there is a procedure for uh, consensual revocation. An attorney under facing discipline of any kind under investigation can't resign their license during that process, um, but they can uh, petition for consensual revocation. And um, well, that I know we don't have a ton of time, so that's um, that. That is the ten thousand, or maybe even the twenty thousand mm -hmm. foot view of what happens in an OLR proceeding. Okay. Um, well, we've, uh, we've, we've gone beyond our, our 75 minutes. Uh, I am going to give each of you a chance to give us some, some parting thoughts uh, in terms of uh, how lawyers continue to navigate the pandemic and clients expectations and, uh, and the issues that have uh, come up and, and given lawyers uh, the most challenge. Uh, Matt? Uh, just real quickly, and it just has to do with how to respond to any of these situations. And, and you know, I would just encourage you to either use your existing network or feel free to call your carrier. If I'm part of your network, great, give me a call. I will talk to you about whatever I can uh, and I'll you know, do my best to help you avoid headaches and, and uh, you know, devoting time to things that aren't productive. Um, and uh, I'm happy to chat. And uh, if you get Brian or Matt, um, you know, we're happy to talk to you and, and we're nice. And I can, I, I can vouch for the niceness of, of Brian and Matt. Um, 
And, and also, um, I think my, my parting words would be hang in there. Um, the very first doses of the vaccine were administered to people outside of clinical trials today. There is vaccine in Wisconsin now. Um, it's not over yet, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, this too shall pass. I can keep going with platitudes if you'd like, but, um, you know, it, it, you know, and just as I advise people, if they get a grievance, deep breaths, I think deep breaths are important and now as well. Um, and, uh, you know, just do what you can to make it to the end of this, through the end of this, safe and healthy. And we will see what it looks like on the other side. Hopefully some of the best practices that we've learned, hopefully none of us will have to drive four hours for a scheduling conference again. Um, but we can start, you know, networking in person and, and working in our preferred settings and uh, seeing people again. Um, and I think that'll, that'll go a long way. I agree. I, I can't wait till we can start being out there uh, seeing lawyers again and, and doing some of these in person, but uh, online works too. And um, there are certainly a lot of, a lot of challenges out there that we're all learning how to deal with. Um, uh, I don't see any other questions from the audience. I want to thank uh, both of you, Matt and Stacy. Thank you so much for your expertise and your time. Uh, and I want to thank Kathleen Detman and Mark Young uh, for their time and expertise earlier today as well. I think it's been a productive three hours. We've learned a lot and covered a lot of ground. So thank you um, to the audience. Uh, thank you for being with us. I just uh, want to mention again, um, if you want to report your credits uh, for this program, it has been approved for three ethics credits. And when you go out uh, to the BBE site to report, um, you will want to click on the button live webcast. That's where you will find this program. All right. So you got to make sure you click on the live webcast button. If you don't, you will not find this program. So uh, when you report, do that. Um, also, we'll send you uh, by email an evaluation form. We'd love to hear your, your feedback and your input on how we can do other programs uh, and, and cover the kind of materials you want to hear. So uh, my name is Tom Watson. I am with Wilmick. And again, thank you for being with us today. And thanks again to our speakers. Much appreciated. Uh, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to all. And uh, we will see you uh, coming up soon. Thank you again. Have a good day.